Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, we are holding a hearing to address the impact of marijuana policies on child welfare. Additionally, we will be hearing two reporting bills, intros 1161 and 1426, to provide transparency to the process and two resolutions, numbers 740 and 746, calling for the clarification of marijuana policies and laws in regard to marijuana and child welfare. I want to thank my co-chair for today's hearing, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, for joining me in bringing this important topic to a hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge council members that are present, uh, Councilmember Donovan Richards, and we expect to be joined by others throughout the hearing. Uh, marijuana use is quickly expanding across the country as more and more states legalize it. As New York State contemplates legalization and marijuana use is rapidly becoming normalized, it is incumbent upon us to scrutinize how our current laws and policies impact families and examine what corrections are needed. 15% of the three, sorry, 34,642 allegations that were referred to ACS between July and September of 2018 were for parental or child substance abuse. That is a significant number of cases. While we know the opioid crisis has heavily influenced these numbers, we also know that a good chunk of these cases are for marijuana use. A child welfare investigation is a huge invasion into the privacy, into someone's privacy, and can be a threat to dignity when ACS workers are calling and visiting your child's school, teachers, friends, the superintendent of your building, and neighbors just because you may have tested positive or said you were using marijuana. We need to ensure that ACS isn't wasting its time and resources on bogus reports and that families are not being subjected to unnecessary investigations and pressured into a needed services to prove that they are worthy enough to keep their children. Current state law is pretty clear that substance use alone is not a cause for indicating a neglect case and that a child's physical, mental, or emotional condition must also be impaired or in imminent danger of becoming impaired due to a parent or guardian's failure to provide minimum care due to the quote-unquote misusing of a drug. According to the National Advocate for Pregnant Women, there is no research that establishes a casual link between a person who has used some amount of controlled substances to the likelihood of abuse of a child. We need to correct our policies that continue to criminalize women, in particular women of color, for their parenting. In a hearing this fall, in, in, in a hearing last fall, ACS testified that mar use, marijuana use alone is not used to justify removing a child from the home, restrict par parental visitations, or keep a child from being reunited with their parents. However, advocates have testified to the opposite being true. In that same hearing, Commissioner Hansel testified that drug use leading to inadequate guardianship could influence a child neglect case, but acknowledged that, quote, inadequate guardianship is a vague indicator. We need more clarity on this issue with or without legalization. Vague directives lead to wide discretion, and this discretion could lead to discrimination. As the Drug Policy Alliance stated in their testimony in, a fall hearing, in the fall hearing on, of this committee, quote, racism and classism combine to capture caregivers in cycles of surveillance and mandated unnecessary services that sever families who can't live up to the expectations of the court. Behaviors deeply scrutinized by ACS and family court judges in these cases would largely go unnoticed in more affluent white communities, close quote. We cannot allow this to continue. Today, our committees will be examining how ACS and Health and Hospitals can work together to ensure that policies are clarified, parents and staff are educated, and children are kept safe without the trauma of unnecessary investigations and separations. In addition to hearing from ACS today, we also want to hear from parent advocates, drug policy advocates, health care providers, and legal services providers about the changes that are needed to ensure a fair and equitable child welfare system. I'd like to thank the council staff for their very hard work today in preparing for the hearing. Council Aminta Kilowan, who uh, has the flu, we wish her well, a speedy recovery, policy analyst Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, and finance analyst Daniel Krupp. I'd also like to thank my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams, and chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher. I'd also like to thank Commissioner David Hansel, who has made many improvements at ACS in his relatively short time as commissioner, and his entire team, who I know have the best interest of New York City's children at heart. 
And with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Carlina Rivera. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. And I want to thank everyone for making it today. Today, we're looking forward to hearing from the representatives of ACS as well at Health and Hospitals and other stakeholders about the impact of marijuana policies on child welfare. We will also discuss legislation and resolutions that aim to provide additional transparency on marijuana use among parents and the impact it has on their families, including Resolution 746, which I am proud to sponsor. The number of people using marijuana during pregnancy has increased significantly in recent years, as mentioned. According to one study from 2009 through 2016, the adjusted prevalence of prenatal marijuana use increased from 4.2% to 7.1% among patients in California. Marijuana is now easier to obtain legally and may in some cases be marketed as having the ability to assist with pregnancy-related symptoms. Despite the increase in use and marketing, we are still not certain about the impact marijuana can have on a pregnant person and their child. The current consensus is that no amount of marijuana has been shown to be safe during pregnancy, and the research currently available has, for the most part, reported potentially negative impacts on children who were exposed to marijuana in the womb. However, some have argued that marijuana use is too often compounded with other drug use and or tobacco use, rendering research results imprecise. In fact, one study from 2016 concluded that marijuana use during pregnancy is not an independent risk factor for adverse neonatal outcomes after adjusting for confounding factors including tobacco. To summarize, we know marijuana use among pregnant people is increasing. We know that the science around it is cautionary, yet not entirely clear. And we know that the legalization of ma recreational marijuana is on the table, which may increase its use. Despite the fact that marijuana is used equally in different communities, regardless of race and socioeconomic status, communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. The impact on pregnant people and their families unsurprisingly reflects this. We know from a study conducted in 20, 2007 that women who are black are more likely to be tested for drugs than their counterparts. We know that testing is significantly associated with black maternal race, single or widowed marital status, lower educational status, unemployment, public or absent health insurance, living in a neighborhood in the, in the poorest quartile, as well as older age. Today, we want to look critically at how these factors impact New York City families. I'm especially interested in the impact drug testing has on people who give birth in our public hospital system. Currently, H&H's drug testing policies are not public and little is known about their implementation. We know that H&H &H drug test parents, based on the standards put forth by the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the ACOG, standards which include testing mothers who have not received or received little prenatal care and those with a history of drug use. We also know that ACOG believes seeking obstetric gyne gynecologic care should not expose a woman to criminal or civil penalties for marijuana use, such as the loss of custody of her children. We know that a drug test indicating marijuana use is not enough reason to initiate a call to ACS according to the state guidelines. Yet 15% of the 34,642 allegations that were referred to ACS between July and September of 2018 were for substance abuse. Today, I want us to address these figures. I want to hear about H&H's decision-making process and why a doctor at H&H would choose to drug test pregnant people and their children. I want to make sure this testing is as fair and equitable as possible, as well as uniform throughout the H&H system. Although a person must consent to having their urine or their child's urine tested, we must ensure this consent is being requested consistently and that testing is transparent and conducted in an unbiased manner. We also need to better understand the circumstances under which hospital staff would decide to initiate a case with ACS and if the decision makers have a firm understanding of the consequences of getting ACS involved. 
The resolution I am sponsoring, which calls on the state to pass legislation requiring the Department of Health to create clear and fair regulations for hospitals on drug testing those who are pregnant or giving birth, would begin to address some of these issues. Still, unlike a law that, like, un, until a law like this exists, we must continue to monitor our city hospitals and ensure fairness and equity. The cycle of inequity and systemic racism and oppression must be eradicated, and this can only happen if we address these issues in an honest and open discussion. I look forward to hearing from H&H &H and ACS, as well as members of the community, about their experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Uh, and before we turn it over to the commissioner, I'd like to uh, ask Councilmember Donovan Richards to deliver opening remarks on his legislation. Thank you, Chairs. And I'm here today to discuss my legislation that was inspired by women of color and their experience and in, experiences in what has become known as the new Jane Crow. While the separation of a parent and their child due to marijuana can and does happen to anyone, women of color are overwhelmingly targeted. That separation may only last a few days or weeks if the parent is lucky, but the negative impacts can last a lifetime. I know the staff at the Administration of Children's Services does incredibly tough and important work, and of course we need to make sure children are safe and healthy in their homes. But I do want to be clear. The use of any drug should never be the sole factor leading to a substantiated allegation of neglect. Last year, Shakira Kennedy stood on the steps of this very building with her twin baby boys swaddled in her arms to advocate for a change in the system. She also wrote an op-ed in the New York Daily News that I'm going to paraphrase to tell some of the, her story. While she was pregnant with her twins, Ms. Kennedy suffered from extreme morning sickness and could not keep any food or water down. She consulted with her doctor and the only thing that helped her was the use of marijuana. Her children tested negative for marijuana, but ACS made her go to court and she was mandated to an outpatient rehab program three days a week or risk losing her three children. She also at risk, was at risk of being flagged for child neglect if her case was, is not sealed, which would leave her unable to work with children until her twins turn 28. As if it's not hard enough already for a single mother to find daycare or to go to work, imagine adding on this additional burden when there's no clear evidence of neglect. I have yet to see a study that confirms a correlation between marijuana use and adverse neonatal out outcomes, but I would like to see the information that ACS is using to make the determination that allegations of usage or proof of usage, usage is evident of neglect. I'd also like to see how often this determination is used and which agency is making these determinations or recommendations, but currently none of that information is public for marijuana or any other reason. Which brings us to intro 1161, which would require ACS to report on the main allegations that led to a report or the opening of a case for investigation of child abuse or neglect. The allegations would specifically include but not be limited to, for example, a parent's or caretaker's marijuana usage, inadequate food, clothing, shelter, or other specified allegations. This information in no way is meant to protect abusive parents. Its goal is to ensure that we are not mislabeling good parents and marking, marking them as abusive for nearly three decades. We have unfortunately had to watch the pain of family separation day after day on our southern border, but the fact of the matter is this happens every day in our city and those stories aren't told as often. We have to do better, we have to be more compassionate, and we have to stop tearing apart families over marijuana. I want to thank the chairs once again for holding uh, this important hearing, critical hearing, uh, in terms of stabilizing communities and families, and I look forward to hearing uh, whether you support the legislation or not. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. Uh, Councilmember Lander for opening remarks as well. Thank you, Chair Levin and Chair Rivera. I have the resolution that in many ways is a pair to Councilmember Richards' intro. The intro is what would require reporting. The reso is what makes clear the Council's strong intention, the point behind it to be 
uh, that we do not use marijuana possession or use or cultivation as the, the pretense for the reason for family separation and taking children. And, you know, I, I am glad that we're in a world where we are all moving away from that and coming to recognize what harm we've done. I note that in the testimony you're going to give, you speak to the December 2018 task force report that reflects many of the same uh, the same point of view we're coming to here today. So I'm glad we're moving in that direction. I don't want us to kind of paper over the harm we've collectively done on all of us. We didn't pass these legislation or resolutions before. The city has not had this set of policies before. So, uh, you know, I, it's good that we are finally getting here. Um, you know, we have let a set of policies around marijuana, drug use, um, presumption, uh, and incarceration do a lot of harm to families, and, and thankfully we are moving toward a better day. Um, but I do think it's important for us to honestly reckon with what we've done together, and that's not more on the administration than it is on the council, but, but I also want to not pretend, uh, pretend it away, like because we've sort of woken up to better policy, we don't own uh, what we've done together. So anyway, that said, I appreciate the hearing. I appreciate the, the legislation. I look forward to uh, the testimony. Thank you. I want to just briefly uh, acknowledge members of my committee that have joined us, uh, council members Eugene, Mazel, Ayala, and Moya. And I'll acknowledge members of the General Welfare Committee that have joined, council member uh, council member Adams, council member Ayala in, in spirit, because she just left the committee, uh, and council member Lander. Um, uh, okay, uh, I will swear, I'll ask the council committee to swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Levin, Chair Rivera, members of the Committees on General Welfare and Hospitals. I am David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. With me today to my right is Natalie Marks, Associate Commissioner of Quality Assurance for our Division of Child Protection. We are pleased to join you today to share more about the work ACS is currently doing to protect child safety and promote family well-being, particularly in cases where there have been allegations and or concerns about substance misuse, including marijuana, as well as the work ahead as we prepare for the possible legalization of marijuana. We are also joined to my left by Dr. Michelle Allen, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of New York City Health and Hospitals who is here to answer any questions about health and hospitals policies and practices. ACS's core mission is to protect and promote the safety and well-being of New York City's children and families. I think we all acknowledge the reality that there are children who experience devastating and tragic neglect while in the care of adults who abuse drugs or alcohol. And it is ACS's responsibility to discern when that danger exists and take action to forestall it. However, in all of our cases, including those with substance misuse allegations, we assess child safety on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at actual or potential harm to a child, and if it exists, the parent's capacity to safely care for that child. Current state and city policy and child welfare best practice is that a parent's use of a substance, legal or illegal, is not in and of itself a basis for finding of neglect, much less for a child's removal or other court action. As we anticipate the decriminalization of marijuana, these principles must guide our response. And as I will explain, we continually review our practices to ensure that they are consistent with these principles as they are embodied in our policies. The characterization of marijuana as an illegal substance is under wide review as lawmakers in Albany continue to discuss possible legalization in New York State. Mayor de Blasio has endorsed the decriminalization of marijuana and has already taken steps to prepare the city for this eventuality. In addition to changes in the city's marijuana enforcement policies that have been instituted by this administration, the mayor formed the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization, the task force as I'll refer to it, last summer which has worked to develop goals, identify challenges, and make recommendations to guide the city's preparation for legalization should a law change occur. 
Along with other city agencies, ACS has been an active member of this task force. And in December of last year, the task force released a report with legislative, regulatory, and policy recommendations to help guide the state's discussion on marijuana legalization and to identify the goals and challenges that should guide the city's preparations for potential legalization. One of these recommendations is directly related to ACS's work and clearly states that parental rights should not be impaired on the basis of cannabis use or cultivation unless it is endangering a child, a principle with which we concur and which is central to our current policies and practices. Let me begin by briefly describing the reporting and investigation framework for our work. When a person, anyone in New York City, suspects that a child is being abused or maltreated, they may make a report to the New York Statewide Central Register of Child Abuse and Maltreatment, or the SCR, which is administered by our state oversight agency, the Office of Children and Family Services. If the state accepts the report, the report is sent directly to the appropriate county, ACS for the five boroughs, to investigate. ACS has no discretion as to whether to conduct an investigation if the state accepts the report. We then have up to 60 days to conduct an investigation. Each year on average, we conduct about 60,000 investigations that involve about 90,000 children. About 20 to 25 percent of these investigations include allegations of substance misuse, usually together with other allegations. ACS's goal during any child protective investigation is to assess child safety. All families and children are different, and our staff is charged with making highly individualized, nuanced assessments based on risks and strengths, and to then take appropriate actions, if necessary, to ensure child safety. By both state and local policy, neither a positive drug test of a parent nor a positive toxicology of a newborn baby is in itself a basis for a determination that evidence of abuse or neglect exists. When investigating allegations of substance misuse, including misuse of marijuana, child protection staff must evaluate whether the parent or caretaker's substance misuse has created a condition where the child's physical, mental, or emotional condition is negatively impacted or is in imminent danger of becoming negatively impacted, and then must assess whether the parent's ability to care for and safeguard the child in the home is impacted by their substance misuse. To assist our child protective staff in cases involving substance use or misuse, ACS utilizes credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselors, generally known as CASACs, as part of our clinical consultation team. CASACs are certified substance abuse experts who are available to all of our CPS to provide support and technical assistance when child protective staff are assessing safety and risk in cases involving substance misuse allegations. The child protection team works with the family to provide supports and respond to service needs that are identified as a result of the investigation. In the vast majority of cases in which ACS identifies an actual or potential risk to children, we work to keep those children at home with their parents or caretakers by engaging the family in prevention services. Where substance misuse is a safety concern, staff may make a referral for voluntary prevention services and or drug treatment uh, for substance misuse. Our full continuum of prevention services is available to families where there is a substance misuse issue impacting safety. We work to best match a family's needs to the right type of service, which could include our general prevention service, our family treatment and rehabilitation services, or FTR, as we call them, our special medical services, or one of our evidence-based models of prevention services. Depending on the severity of the substance misuse concern, and other service needs the parent may have, the prevention services provider may work in partnership with a substance abuse treatment program to address the parent or caretaker's substance misuse and mitigate risk to the children in the home. In higher risk cases, where the primary safety concern is the parent or care caregiver's substance misuse or mental health disorder, CPS may refer the family for FTR services. Our FTR programs 
offer clinical diagnostic teams comprised of licensed therapists, case acts, case planners, psychologist consultants, psychiatric consultants, and other providers who can work with families to develop treatment plans to address risk factors and bolster child safety. More recently, we've begun to identify supports that we can offer to families and communities independent of child welfare involvement with the goal of avoiding such involvement altogether. Our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing is developing a set of services, community-level interventions, and public education activities that can build on parents' strengths and protective capacities. Let me provide one relevant example. As you probably know, approximately 50 infants in New York City die every year because of unsafe sleep practices. Most often, that involves bed sharing by parents with an infant. And tragically, that often occurs when a parent is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. To help parents avoid this risk, just last month, we completed our citywide rollout in partnership with health and hospitals to distribute our safe sleep toolkits to maternity patients at all the city's 11 health and hospitals maternity facilities. The kits contain educational materials designed to be taken home by parents to share with family members and others who help take care of the new baby and will reinforce the safe sleep information that hospital staff are required by law to provide to maternity patients at the time of discharge. The kits also include a safe sleep brochure, a DVD, a wearable blanket or sleep sack, crib netting, an infant onesie, and a board book called Sleep Baby Safe and Snug. This is one example of our focus on trying to identify services and supports that can assist parents in caring for their children and keeping them safe. So in summary, ACS's current policy requires our child protective staff to assess the impact a parent's substance misuse may be having on a child, regardless of whether the substance is alcohol, marijuana, prescribed drugs, or illicit opioids. Our goal and our practice is to intervene with drug treatment or prevention services to keep children safe at home whenever that is possible. Now, while the legal context for marijuana may shift uh, soon at the state level, we're committed to continuing our work with our sister city agencies to ensure that our policies and our practices evolve congruently with any future changes in the law. As a member of the task force, ACS helped to develop and shape section two, recommendation number 14 of the December report, which is captioned, parental rights should not be impaired on the basis of cannabis use or cultivation unless endangering a child. ACS strongly endorses this recommendation, which includes the following components. Number one, child custody or visitation should not be denied on the basis of cannabis use or cultivation unless it places a child in danger. Our top priority for every family we encounter is the safety of the children. And this recommendation aligns with the agency's commitment to family preservation and child safety and is also consistent with our current foster care policies. Part two of the recommendation says that no child should be, subject, should be the subject of a child neglect or abuse investigation or proceeding based solely on the parent's alleged use of cannabis. Anyone who suspects that a child is being abused or neglected can call the state central registry to make a report and the state decides whether to accept that report. As I said earlier, if the state accepts the report on a New York City child, ACS has no discretion as to whether to investigate the report. We are required by law to do so. But the state should not accept and refer for investigation reports that do not contain allegations of risk to a child, such as reports based solely on a parent's alleged use of cannabis. We've been in conversations with the State Office of Children and Family Services and are verifying that the SCR does not accept substance use related complaints, nor refer cases to ACS to investigate when there is no allegation of impact on child safety. Part three of the recommendation says that cannabis use or cultivation should not generate a presumption of child neglect or endangerment. The focus of our investigations is on determining whether parents' actions have an impact on child safety or create a risk to children and the use of cannabis in and of itself does not equate with risk of harm. Part four of the recommendation states that a positive cannabis test in and of itself should not equate automatically to a compelling measure of maltreatment in the context of child welfare. 
And again, our current policies and procedures require ACS to base safety and risk assessments on the impact that substance misuse may have on child safety. A positive cannabis test in itself should never be considered maltreatment. And fifth, the recommendation states that cannabis should be defined as equivalent to a quote unquote drug in the Family Court Act in order to remain within the ambit of substances that can lead to investigation or supervision of parents if a child is endangered by parental use, even if the cannabis use is not criminalized at the state level. In effect, cannabis use should be treated the same as alcohol use in the context of child custody. And as previously stated, our concern is not cannabis use itself, but the impact it could have on child safety. And that is the focus of our investigations. And we will maintain that focus regardless of the criminality status of cannabis. So this task force recommendation is consistent with ACS's policy. Now, as in all areas of our work, we are constantly striving to ensure that our case practice is universally consistent with our policies. Similarly here, with regard to parents' use or misuse of marijuana, we take active steps to ensure that our practice is aligned with all applicable policies. To do this, we use our robust quality assurance and oversight mechanisms to reinforce appropriate practice, including child stat, supervisory case reviews, provider agency monitoring system case audits, and our annual collaborative quality improvement plans for all of our providers. We also recognize that the history of the criminal enforcement of marijuana laws has not fallen equally on all communities. The fact that marijuana is illegal and that people of color and poor people have been disproportionately affected by enforcement is a reality that we cannot ignore. It is critical that we not allow bias or historical precedent to affect our decision making. And we as an agency have committed to a number of steps to address and further equity across all of our work. This includes our recently launched mandatory implicit bias training for all ACS staff, the creation of our new Office of Equity Strategies, and a new equity assessment that will help us implement strategies that identify and forestall potential racial and other inequities in each of our program areas. Let me now turn to the bills that are under consideration by the council committees today. I believe we share the same goals and spirit as the council in the areas embodied in these bills. But as currently written, we do have some concerns about the bill's operational challenges, including the availability of some of the data that ACS would be required to report. But as always, we are happy to work with the council to address these concerns. Beginning with intro 1161, um, we very much appreciate the Council's interest in better understanding the types of allegations that ACS investigates. We currently provide quarterly child welfare reports to the Council pursuant to Local Law 20 of 2006. This proposed intro would amend the law to require ACS to disaggregate our current child welfare quarterly report by the numerous specific allegation types listed in the bill. We are required to use the state system of record, which is called Connections, to track child welfare cases. Due to limitations in the Connections system, we don't currently have the technical capacity to aggregate allegation data regarding use of marijuana or any specific drug for that matter. The state has launched new upgrades to Connections in mid-January of this year, which will eventually allow us to develop some new reporting functionality. While there hasn't yet been training on the new fields, the state did just recently release some preliminary guidance uh, at the end of March regarding the use of the new fields, which include drop downs for child protective staff to select specific substances parents or caretakers are found to be using or misusing. According to the guidance from the state, however, the state doesn't intend the new functionality to track the specific drugs and child welfare allegations which is what the City Council legislation is seeking ACS to report on. We're currently having additional conversations with the state to see if the system can provide greater specificity with regard to maltreatment allegations and whether it could provide the capacity in the future to capture specific drugs in those allegations. And also, we're st still clarifying with the state how the new data will be accessible for data reporting by ACS. So we look forward to discussing this further with the Council as soon as we have more clarity from the state. 
The current quarterly child welfare report also includes a number of child welfare related statistics, some elements of which are now outdated, including items related to caseload and workload. As you know, Local Law 18 of 2018 requires ACS to conduct a workload study pertaining to our CPS staff, which is currently underway. We are due to issue a report on the findings of this study to the Council in September of this year, and we anticipate that the information in that report will be useful in informing amendments to Local Law 20. We're committed to transparent information sharing with the Council, and we're happy to engage in further discussion about how best to update Local Law 20 to be useful and informative to the Council and other stakeholders. And we look forward to working with the Council on options that could be available given ACS's current data limitations relating to the statewide system of record. We would respectfully urge the Council to hold intro 1161 pending further conversation with us and submission of the agency's workload study report in September. Turning to intro 1426, uh, this proposed legislation would require ACS to report annually on the number, type, and outcomes of investigations initiated by ACS as a result of positive drug screens from drug tests performed at facilities managed by New York City Health and Hospitals. The proposed bill would also require us to disaggregate this information by h and facility and by a number of other factors such as age, income, gender, ethnicity, date of drug test, different types of drugs, number of investigations initiated by ACS, and the outcomes of those investigations. We appreciate the Council's intent to better understand systems and processes that affect the everyday lives of New Yorkers. A core part of our agency's vision is to identify and confront the disproportionate impact that the child welfare system has had on historically marginal groups. ACS is taking important steps to address these issues through primary prevention services and equity-focused initiatives. However, this bill presents a number of operational concerns and other challenges that, again, we look forward to discussing further with the Council. As written, the bill does not accurately capture the process of how a family might come to the attention of ACS, which in turn would create fundamental operational challenges for us in producing the report that the, the bill envisions. The draft bill presumes that h and would be referring cases to ACS directly and then ACS would determine when to do an investigation. This actually does not happen. Whenever a report of suspected abuse or maltreatment is made, that report goes to New York State, to the SCR. The state determines whether to accept the report, and if it does, it sends it to the appropriate county to investigate. And by law, as I've said, ACS is required to investigate any report we receive from the state. We have no discretion with regard to determining whether to conduct an investigation. In addition, the bill would require ACS to disaggregate the data in ways that we're not currently technologically able to do, and in some instances may not have the requested information at all. Also, we're concerned about the unintended consequences that could arise from legislation requiring the collection of personal information and then public reporting of those data. This reporting requirement could create a chilling effect on reporters' willingness to call the SCR even when there might be a serious child safety risk, and it might also dissuade people from seeking medical attention to avoid having their personal information shared with government entities for the purpose of collecting data for a public report. Finally, we're concerned that the level of specificity in the aggregation required by the proposed bill could unintentionally impact a parent's confidentiality. So in closing, I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss how the legalization of marijuana would impact child welfare. To reiterate and quote from the recommendation from the Mayor's Task Force, cannabis use should not generate a presumption of child neglect, neglect or, or endangerment, and nor should a positive test in and of itself equate automatically to a compelling measure of maltreatment in the context of child welfare. Our case-specific determinations now and in the future must focus on the safety of children and the support of families. We also thank you for the opportunity to discuss the City Council's proposed legislation. We appreciate the Council's leadership and focus on these important topics and look forward to working with you to refine the bills so that they can best serve the interests of New York City's children and families and the dedicated workforce who serve them. And we are happy to take your questions.
Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Councilmember Reynoso has opening remarks uh, on his legislation. No, I'm going to defer my opening remarks for questions, so I'll wait for the questions. Well. Thank you, though, Councilmember Levin. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso. Thank you. So the, thank you, thank you so much. I wanted to ask a little bit, um, actually, let me start with just a task force question. So you have recommendations that came out of the task force which seem aligned with our principles and values. What is gonna happen with the recommendations? And, and, and where is the task force going? If you could just give us a very brief kind mm -hmm. of summary. Yep. Well, the, the task force recommendations, I think, were essentially twofold. One was they were recommendations to the state and to the state legislature about how it should proceed with uh, decriminalization of marijuana, and, and I assume the state legislature will do what it wishes with those. Um, but they were also intended and directed to city agencies to make sure that our policies are aligned with them, so that all of the members, and there were many city agencies represented on the task force, and including ACS, um, who contributed to it, um, the goal is to make sure that our policies are, and our practices are aligned with the uh, recommendations. Um, and that is a review that we've been doing uh, at ACS since December when, when that was issued. Um, as I said in, in the testimony, we believe that our policies are aligned, um, although we continue to review to make sure that's the case. Um, and certainly if, if the law changes at the state level, we'll then do a review based on uh, compliance with the law and any guidance we get from the state around the legislation. Um, and then the other thing that we are, are uh, continuously engaged in is making sure that our practice as we uh, investigate every allegation we receive, as we interact with every family, making sure that the, pac the practice is aligned with those policies, which in turn must be aligned with the task force recommendations. So we're here today pres uh, having a hearing regarding introductions as well as resolutions, because I think what's most concerning is that even though you seem very aligned with how we feel on how these reports should be handled and investigated, you do have very limited discretion when it comes to the state office. So we are looking to also lobby our colleagues in Albany to make those changes. So I'm gonna stick with some questions about H&H's testing policy to get a little bit of clarification on how that works. And, and thank you, Dr. Allen, for being here. So what is H&H's drug testing policy? So, we have a corporate policy for testing mothers, which is really based on signs and symptoms of drug use. And the purpose of the testing is to identify women who are using drugs and to, based on a medical model, provide them the appropriate treatment. I've been actually working with substance abusing moms and moms who are at risk for HIV since 1982 when I was at Harlem Hospital and established a special prenatal clinic within the methadone clinic at Harlem Hospital to emphasize the medical model. And when I went to Bellevue in 1988, established a special prenatal care clinic there as well for women who were substance using, at risk for HIV infection, and also victims of domestic violence. And the care we provided there was a family-centered care, multidisciplinary, where we actually had a designated nurse, designated social worker, designated psychologist, and had HIV counselors as well. And the purpose of, the, of our teamwork was to make sure that the mother was safe during her pregnancy. We had established a one-to-one -one relationship with the patients and acknowledged that our mutual goal was for her to get to the term, a full-term pregnancy with an appropriate born child, drug-free with an intact mother-child um, dyad on the time of discharge. We do urine drug toxicologies just to establish a basis of truth and transparency so that we know when we become drug-free, we know if we're still using, we know if there's more intervention that is needed. The criteria for testing a mom during pregnancy include a number of things, including whether she shows up with no prenatal care at the time of delivery, whether she's had limited prenatal care, whether she's ex exhibiting inappropriate behavior, such as somnolence, loose associations, etc. We look at physical signs of substance abuse or, in fact, withdrawal. If she's a obviously inebriated or intoxicated, whether she's had any recent history of substance abuse or treatment, 
whether there's an unexplained fetal demise would be an indication for drug testing. Placental abruption is known to be a complication of cocaine use, so if someone presents with no prenatal care and a placental abruption, it results in a drug test. And in, in addition, stroke or heart attack, smoking crack, using cocaine has actually been related to intracerebral hemorrhage and strokes in women who are pregnant or women who are not pregnant or abnormal mood swings. So those are the criteria for testing. And the purpose of testing is to make, ensure that the, pa that the patient, the prospective mom, has a full-term pregnancy without complications and delivers drug-free and maintenance of the mother-child dyad. Where can you find this policy? Is it public? It's not public. It's on our, it's an internal document that is available for all staff at H&H. &H. Can a patient request the policy? To date, they have not, but since it's not public, I don't think it would be readily available for her. So how are they informed of the policy? At the time of, we are, Instructed based on the policy, we cannot get a urine toxicology without her consent. So, at the time of broaching the subject of urine toxicology, our policy says she must be informed, she must know why, she must know the risks, and she must know the benefits. So, there needs to be a conversation, an informed consent. If she doesn't consent, she is not tested. So, you do tell the patient about possible legal consequences. We do inform her of that. How do you document the informed consent? The policy states that the conversation needs to be documented in the medical record, that the conversation took place, that the patient was informed of the benefits and the risks. So it's a doctor's note? It would be in the doctor's note. So she doesn't sign anything? There's no, like, con like I've, I've received it's this? Not, there's no written affirmation of having received this information. So you mentioned all the indicators, um, including something like limited prenatal care. How do you determine these indicators? And the reason why I ask is because H&H &H serves an incredibly diverse population of New Yorkers, including people with a limited understanding of the healthcare system. So even though when you're pregnant, you do have uh, the resources, if you know how to access them, to get prenatal care, many people don't have that information. Maybe it's a language barrier. Absolutely. Maybe it's they're afraid to seek these services because Absolutely. of the political climate that we're in. So how do you determine these indicators, and, and what do you do to make sure that people understand all the risks mm -hmm. and, and how you clarify how the results are going to be used? So absolutely, you're 100% correct. Our patients come from all over the world. Um, many of them don't speak English, and I need to say that we actually we take care of everybody, whether they're no matter race, risk, ethnicity, religion, immigration status, literacy level, and very cognitive and sensitive to not only whether patients are um, able to speak and understand English, but what their medical health literacy is as well. So we do not pretend to speak a patient's other language. We are actually mandated to have, if not a personal interpreter in the room, we actually access the AT&T operator, so we have dual handset phones, so we're, there, we're speaking in the patients, or the patient can actually, it's being translated, whatever we're saying, it's translated back to the patient, whatever the patient says, it's translated back to us. And usually with the informed consent, what we like to use is the read-back method or the talk-back method. If I say to you, um, I'm going to test your urine, you told me you have had a history of drug use um, as part of my prenatal care to make sure that we have an honest conversation and we both agree that we want to be drug-free at the end of the pregnancy, I would like to do a urine pregnancy test not a pregnancy test, a urine drug test. And then I will ask you, do you understand what I've just said? Can you tell me what it is I've just said to you? Because I think we all know, even in our personal relationships, what I say to you may not exactly be what you hear. There's often a disconnect between what people say and what the recipient hears. So it's very important to get the patient to reiterate what you said so that you're very clear that they've understood you. So 
when you ask a, a, a mother whether she's going to be tested or whether the child, the infant, is going to be tested, is the consent the same way it's a doctor's note in which she verbally said it was okay? Yes, so the difference in the, I don't test the babies. So it's the pediatrician and it's the same setup, it's the same conversation. The pediatrician have that conversation with the mom to get her consent. If the baby is actively withdrawing, showing signs or symptoms of drug toxicity as with cocaine or withdrawing as with heroin, for medical reasons, if the mother refuses the consent, for medical reasons, the child would have to be tested so that if there's a differential diagnosis and you've ruled out everything else, you need to know what, what, the, what the causes of are the infantile seizures, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera. So I just want to confirm, there's nothing in writing that is memorializing consent to testing. It's other than the doctor's note. In other the than the doctor's note. Yeah. How is the staff trained regarding the drug testing policy? The staff is uh, trained by in-services within the, the specific facility and the specific service. Um, we have the opportunity to train at the CMO level, at the service director level, and at the frontline staff level. So we're always concerned about implicit bias, and I know you mentioned training, and, and I'll ask about that in a second. And we know that H&H, &H, again, you serve this immensely diverse population. And I know just in, in Elmhurst Hospital alone, there's you know, well over 100 languages spoken, so I appreciate you addressing the language barrier. What percentage of pregnant people who are of color are drug tested? So we actually do not put in our medical records a patient's race, ethnicity, or citizenship status. And when we send laboratory data to the lab, whether it's blood or urine, we do not document patient's race or ethnicity. It's not a formal field that's tracked, monitored, or reported on clinically. So when the person, right, so when the person, I'm just curious as to, I guess, why, considering that there is a, a lengthy, and I realize there's confidentiality issues and there are ways of reporting data to not reveal someone's identity or breach confidentiality, but when you're talking about a language barrier and you're either establishing some sort of hotline or, as you said, a personal interpreter, which I also think can sometimes be problematic considering technical expertise in language, how do you determine when someone should have access to an interpreter? So we do ask not only what is the primary language, but what is your preferred language, and we communicate with patients with their preferred language. So you may have someone who actually is a native Spanish speaker but prefers to speak in English, then we will use their preferred language or maybe bilingual and actually would prefer to speak in Spanish. So that is something that we all document in our medical records. So you don't have, you have no data right now of whether there's a percentage of white patients versus immigrants, for example, being tested? Absolutely do not track immigrant status. I can say in the general population, the demographics of Bellevue Hospital, we have uh, across the system about 1.3% of patients do not self-identify as any race. We have 5.48% Asian, 34% Black, 39% Hispanic, Hispanic. 7% white, so we know what our general demographics are. So you have by race who's drug tested and who's not? Right, we have just demographics across. Because we saw, I think you noticed in our testimony, we're very concerned with how the disparity between how mothers of color are tested with more frequency, more frequently, excuse me, than, than, non, um, than, than white mothers. So how do H&H &H drug testing levels compare to other New York City-based hospitals? I have no idea. I don't have that data. I do and have to say that we are very sensitive to disparities, as you know, from recent literature, and we've known this a while, that throughout the healthcare system, there's been inequity in including minority patients, including women in clinical trials. Um, and as you know, there's been, in the lay press as well as in our literature, the disparities in terms of maternal morbidity and mortality and outcomes. So we're very sensitive to that. 
we are in the process of training our entire staff throughout H&H &H on unconscious bias. Uh, we've established online modules as well. We're working very closely with DOHMH on the maternity side with trauma training around trauma-informed care as well as unconscious bias. So this is something that we are very sensitive to. We feel very strongly about it. Um, we are also implementing that on all levels of care from our chief medical officers to our chief nursing officers to our frontline staff and OBGYN and then the online modules for the entire staff. And I just have just two last questions before I turn it over to, to my co-chair. What if a person does not consent? What happens? Don't test. We don't test the mom without consent. And that's documented in the file as well? It's documented that she refused consent. What happens if a pregnant person, a person who just gave birth, or the newborn tests positive for marijuana? The newborn test is positive for marijuana. Is that your question? It's what happens if, if the person, even if it's a pregnant person, they do test positive. So we, our purpose of testing is for medical purposes to identify patients who actually need treatment. We do not refer anybody to the state central registry for child abuse and neglect. We just, the obstetrician just does not do that. So does the mother know when that she can refuse consent? Oh, absolutely. And this is through the verbal policy yeah. that is told between the doctor and patient that's documented by the doctor in the file? Right. Okay. Thank you so much for answering my questions. I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair. Thank you very much, um, Chair Rivera. I want to also acknowledge uh, Councilmember Mark Traeger has been joining us. And um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your answers, Dr. Allen. Um, I, uh, I do want to follow up on a few questions around health and hospitals, if that's okay. Um, first question, um, I, I wasn't quite clear. Um, in response to Councilmember Rivera's question about why uh, we don't track um, race or ethnicity um, in terms of um, uh, the, the, the number of times people are tested at health and hospitals uh, or given those, administered those tests. Um, do we not believe that that would be instructive in terms of um, identifying potential implicit bias uh, within our health and hospital system um, if we were able to track that? Yeah, so first of all, it's not part of the, as I said, it's not part of the clinical record at all. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, it would be very important for us to be informed of uh, situations where there are more than unconscious bias, but in fact explicit bias. Right. Um, I think from a systems perspective, we are committed to taking care of all patients equitably, whether they're from Pakistan, Vietnam, Eastern Europe, West Africa. Sure. And being that greater than 90% of our patients are of color, it would be hard pressed f for us to say that we treat of color patients better than Caucasian patients since we have very few Caucasian patients. Mm. Right, I mean, it, it, I, um, even so, there's, yeah. there's data that we could extrapolate from f if we were to have that information, um, you know, the same way that we have been able to uh, extrapolate from marijuana arrests um, uh, how uh, marijuana is being policed in New York I, City. I think that's very important information. Um, would ha we're very much open to figuring out how to do that without having the race be actually used against the patient. So okay. I'm very happy to discuss further with you how we could best do that and track that. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar, there was a, uh, an article in Rolling Stone from last fall um, that spoke about a specific case uh, of a mother in Brooklyn uh, who uh, used marijuana during her second pregnancy for, to relieve nausea um, and uh, uh, volunteered the information to her obstetrician and upon the birth of her children had um, uh, had an ACS case called in or an SCR case 
Um, and while the case was eventually dismissed, there was an investigation. I think there might have been some intervention. I don't know if there were preventive services. Um, but uh, in that case, you know, there were some consequences exclusively for her use of marijuana uh, during pregnancy. And I'm just wondering how this all, I, I, my, my question is, I understand policy, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not quite sure if that translates to practice mm -hmm. uh, all the time. And so, I mean, without getting into it, I'm sure you can't speak to the details of that case. I don't even know if that was, if the children were born at, at a health and hospitals hospital, but, um, but it, 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 it highlights a kind of, uh, a, 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 she can't be the only one right, who had that experience. Right, and it is of concern. I, I just have to say, for the most part, our providers know what our expectations are, know what our policies are, and the most part are, comply with those policies. I think there will be rare exceptions, and I'm as concerned as you are how frequently this happens throughout the city, whether it's in the voluntary sec sector or in the public sector. On your opening remarks, Councilwoman Rivera, you mentioned NAPW, and I've worked with them very closely, um, very much aware of the criminalization and incarceration disproportionately to women of color. And we as, a, as an enterprise feel very strongly to be to not allow that to happen within that systems. Um, and would be very open, if, as you hear of things, to share them with us because we're always looking to improve. Um, we don't like to know about, the, we don't like to hear about that sto those stories and more than that, we don't want them occurring in our facilities. Um, okay. I, I think our, and I appreciate you saying that, I think our issue is that there's, there's not only no data tracked, even though you know the race of patients, there's no data tracked on the people that are being served in terms of also getting consent. How do we know the conversation remains the same from doctor to doctor when there's no uniform policy memorialized? I don't think a doctor's note is sufficient. And I, I found the answers a, a bit underwhelming. And I, and I think that if we can maybe work together to figure out you know, what are the steps to getting that confirmed consent? How do we make sure they get the interpreter, that they know what's going on, the, the, the legal consequences? It seems it's all, you know, a, a written line. And you have some talented and brilliant physicians and nurses and physician assistants in the H&H &H system. However, with nothing uniform, it seems that discretion can lead to some serious problems and challenges. So You're absolutely I, right. You're I just want to right. put that, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt my colleague, but yeah. we find no data tracking and no uniform way to confirm consent when there are clearly obstacles in communication mm -hmm. and limited understanding and proficiency, not just in language, but in a very complex healthcare system that we have to do a little bit better. So I a think the, the written consent is the way to go. The same way we get written consent with procedures and tests that if we're going to do uh, urine toxicology that has specific risks as well as benefits, that we are open to implementing a written consent process. Um, does, does health and hospitals differentiate between um, marijuana or other illicit substances uh, when a toxicology report uh, is returned in terms of whether uh, as a mandated reporter people would make a, refer a referral to SCR? So as you probably know, pro one of the most deleterious substances in pregnancy is alcohol, oh, right. which is legal. And the literature is very clear that alcohol is the leading cause of mental retardation among children. Mm -hmm. um, nic nicotine in cigarettes actually impairs the growth of the fetus and oxygenation of the fetus. So from a medical perspective, whether it's legal or illegal, we'd have the same intervention. We want to know. We're actually working with our behavioral health team to make, to make sure in order to make the urine drug testing more objective than subjective, the best thing to do before test is screening. Um, so we've worked with the behavioral health team to come up with the appropriate screening tools. Right. If someone is using alcohol, if someone's using nicotine, there's interventions we can provide for that. Um, 
Nicotine is the patch, alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the best we have. Um, and from my perspective and our perspective, whether a drug is legal or illegal, if it has impact on parenting, if it has impact on the growing fetus, then we treat it all the same. Yes? Okay, so, um, well, yes and no. I mean, the, I can't, there are plenty of obstetricians in our country that would off the record recommend to expected mothers or, or I'll say to expected mothers, a glass of wine here or there is okay. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to get involved in this entire debate right now, here and now, but it's, it's, it's not unheard of in our country that an obstetrician would say off the record to an expected mother, you can have a glass of wine maybe two or three times a week. Um, now that doesn't show up on a urinalysis test, probably not. You know, uh, more than ten hours later. But uh, if someone were to smoke marijuana, uh, that would show up. Uh, you know, three weeks later, on a urinalysis test. And but in any event, we would never. It's not as if we would say. It, it's not as if we would make a, a referral for casual for a casual glass of wine. Uh, with an expected mother, whereas now it's an indicator if somebody comes out with a, a, a positive test, urine test for marijuana, even if it could have been three weeks later and it could have been the result of just as casual a use as, as that glass of wine. So as was stated earlier, a single urine positive test not, does, not inter, does not relate to neglect, parental neglect. So there are many other confounding factors that need to be considered. But we've heard from attorneys uh, uh, numerous times, and this article shows a specific example, um, where a single test, positive test, did result in a call to SCR. And we, I don't think we could say with confidence that absent uh, other risk factors uh, that uh, a, a positive urinalysis test for marijuana does not trigger an SCR call in, in some instances. We don't know how many. We have no idea. We hear anecdotally from people who have experienced it or from attorneys. Um, you know, I don't think that they're misrepresenting the truth. But since we don't, since we're kind of, we don't have clear data as to how, how we're tracking this, either from health and hospitals or from ACS or from OCFS, it's hard for us to really get a better, clearer picture than just the anecdotal responses that we're getting from people who have been impacted. So I agree with you and would be happy to continue this discussion and be open to any suggestions. Okay. Have we been coordinating with legal services providers? This is a, it's a question for either ACS or Health and Hospitals that, are, that, that often are representing uh, uh, clients in, in child welfare cases. Um, uh, CFR or Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defenders, uh, about uh, about um, uh, how the policy, how policies are 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 being implemented in practice. We, yeah, I mean, we meet on a very regular basis with the um, providers that represent both parents and children in family court, as you know. Uh, under in New York law and practice, um, both parents and children are entitled to representation in family court. Um, and uh, there are institutional providers that represent parents and children separately. And yes, we meet with them on a regular basis. We discuss issues that, uh, that they think are systemic or representative of, of, of issues that they have concerns with at a policy level. Uh, we try to work those through. We try to uh, uh, address them as best we can. Um, and then they also bring to us individual cases. Obviously, we litigate individual cases, but they also uh, will often bring to us individual cases where they, uh, they think that um, uh, our, our practice has not been consistent with policy, and they ask us to look at those. So yes, we do that on a regular basis. And so I've, and there's been a, they've brought ACS's attention to the, uh, the fact that there are people, that there are cases where it seems as if that was the sole indicator. Is that? I mean, is that, uh, I mean, is, uh, have they brought that to your attention we, as a kind of systemic had, issue? Yeah, we certainly had conversations about with that, that okay. with them, yes. Um, okay. Uh, back to uh, health and hospitals policy, Dr. Allen. Um, the article uh, speaks to 
uh, the policy of 2014 that outlines the criteria, criteria as, as you indicated. I don't need to, uh, to go over that again. Um, and, but it says here, general, quote, generally speaking, a list like this would perpetuate stigma and selective screening. Sorry, uh, generally speaking, a list like this would perpetuate stigma, stigma, and selective screening is not recommended in most contexts, says ACOG's uh, Dr. Turplin. Um, so is there a, do, are we taking issue with that characterization? Do we think that it is, um, that it does not perpetuate stigma or could not be, uh, that, it, it, that, that the health and hospitals guidelines are the appropriate guidelines or ought they be revisited now, in especially, you know, it's been five years now since it has gone into effect and whether that's worth revisiting? Absolutely worth revisiting. We're in a constant, we constantly review our policies and procedures and our recommendations. Okay. Um, and is there anything in particular that you think is uh, an issue that may be open for, uh, specifically within the guidelines that are open for revisiting? Are there other jurisdictions that we can learn from uh, elsewhere in the country that take a different approach to, to testing? When you say other jurisdictions, you mean other states? Other states, other cities. Yeah, so I would not want to follow public hospital systems. The states that actually are incarcerating women based on drug testing and screening. Um, totally open to learning, as mm -hmm. I said before. Totally uh, open to improvement. We do constant review of our policies and procedures. Are they pertinent to the particular date and time and to the circumstances and other extraneous? factors, okay. external factors. Um, I have one last question, and then I'm going to allow my colleagues to ask questions, and then I'll, I'll have to come back at the end. But um, is there any research that we know of in any medical journals um, that, that make a correlation between marijuana use or casual marijuana use and, um, and uh, adverse uh, impacts on a, on a fetus like the ones that you mentioned for alcohol or nicotine yeah. or, or cocaine or, or heroin or methamphetamines, which are obviously pretty demonstrable? So I think we were very early in marijuana where it's actually legal in a few states, so we're mm -hmm. really hampered to do the randomized prospective controlled study. So most right. of what we're seeing in the literature is anecdotal. Um, and having done a review of the literature recently, it's thought to be of poor quality so far, not really very rigorous. Right. Um, it's ethical issues around double-blind studies, I imagine. Right, yeah. yeah. So there's nothing in the literature that says that there's any significant sequelae mm -hmm. um, for marijuana utilization during pregnancy. A lot more research needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Uh, first question, Councilmember Richards. Thank you, uh, Chair, this is a great hearing. Uh, so in 2018, uh, how many removals of newborn children were executed by ACS due to a positive toxicology for marijuana? Um, well, none would have been executed f solely for a positive toxicology for marijuana. We can, I can, uh, and if you can also go through the last five years and also do you have a breakdown by borough? Uh, I don't have that information readily. We're happy to provide that information to you and to the council. So you do have, okay, so we, we have you don't have any of this information? Or? We have information on number of, of removals, and we certainly can do that geographically. I'm actually looking for our data. Okay. <laughs> do you have the, the other? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. We don't have it by borough. But we could. We okay, could, yes, let's we move could. away from borough. Can you just give specific numbers? So how many removals of newborn children were executed by ACS due to a positive toxicology for marijuana? Well, as I said, not none. None right. would have been executed solely for. All right. So, can you give me numbers on marijuana plus whatever else? We don't have currently. Uh, unfortunately, as I said in my testimony, Councilmember, we don't have uh, information by specific drug type because the state system, uh, until three months ago, didn't even allow that information to be entered into the system. 
It now does, but uh, the state has only given us guidance so far that doesn't uh, suggest that they want it to be used by, to determine the type of allegation by specific drug. So that's a conversation uh, we're going to have to continue to have with the state. We've just gotten that guidance literally in the last week or so, two. Just take me through that again, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Okay. So um, until, until th so let me back up, so uh, we are required uh, on, by, by the state to use their uh, system of record, which is called connection. So all of the data we collect, uh, first of all, the, the, all the information from the report that comes into the state central registry in the first place that gets referred to us is referred through that system. So that system determines what information we get, which is about the allegation that was uh, right. the basis for the right. report. And then as we do our investigation, we are required to uh, enter any information that we collect in the course of that investigation that may be much more specific than was in the original report. We're required to enter that into that system, into the connection system. And that is the sole, uh, you know, form okay. of documentation. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of state, state, state. So state of mind I want to get into is what prevents ACS from, so state law prevents you from collecting data on um, marijuana, uh, is that what I'm saying? So because there's a database that doesn't have a Dropbox that would collect this specific information, you have never collected, there's no notes, there's no information on marijuana connected to the website, or maybe I'm just not reading this or hearing this correctly. No, that's correct. We are required to use that system to collect information. That system, however, does now, as of January, have a drop-down box that will allow the collection of some information by individual drug type. That didn't okay. exist until three months ago. So as of January, can you give me the numbers? No, because uh, the state, we're still in discussions with the state about how they want us to use that new functionality. <laughs> <laughs> um, but part of that discussion we will have with the state is... Wait, so hold on. So you said three months ago, they, this specific drop box, whatever this is, um, allows you to, to, to enter this data, correct? It, 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 the functionality was added to the system. So the functionality was added, which means right. that you could now check the specific drug type, or I'm just trying to understand which changed in three mm -hmm. months. Uh, let me let uh, Associate Commissioner okay. Mark speak, since her, her, her staff that are really- I had a long now. night last night, so it's forgive <laughs> me. If, <laughs> it's very if I'm not If I'm not understanding this and comprehending this as much as I should, but- Sorry. I think the drop down, um, the, the state's intention is for us to use it to determine use versus allegations of marijuana. And that's some of the clarity that we're still seeking. Is it, you know, the allegation that is called into the state central registry, or is it what we actually discover when we go out to do the investigation? So that's the clarity we're still seeking. Um, and, you know, we don't want to enter inappropriate data. So we're, we're waiting for clarification on that. So nowhere in your records right now do you have records on specific marijuana allegations? Not in an aggregated way that we can give you that information. But you do have that information? We don't have it. Um, so when, when, when the report gets called in, there's a narrative field, and the narrative field is where the allegations get entered. And so that's like a paragraph of what the reporter told the person answering the fo phone at the state central registry. So it's, it's not in a way that we can report it out at this time. So let me ask you this, and I'm just going to go back to your testimony, Mr. Commissioner. You spoke of, uh, as you probably know, approximately 50 infants in New York City die every year because of unsafe sleep practices. Most often that involves bed sharing by parents and infant and infants, and tragically, that often occurs when a parent is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Can you, can you just elaborate a little further on that statement? Yeah, uh, let me begin, and then I'll let Associate Commissioner Mark speak to that. But so- And, and, and is that conclusive data, or, I mean, where are you- It is- These are it, substantiated. How many of these were related to marijuana? Yeah, it is not our data, because the investigation of fatali those fatalities, like other uh, child fatalities are actually done by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, not by ACS. But you cited this data in your testimony, so can you 
if you're going to cite this, and we're talking about marijuana today, um, I feel it should be a little bit more specific. So would you say marijuana has aided is a part of this, or? I would say in, in some cases with infant fatalities, marijuana did play a role in and that's in is that conclude is that factual or are we um, speaking hypothetically right um, now? I don't have a number right now, but but okay. having reviewed cases from the medical examiner, those were some of the findings that they may have made. They may have or they have? They have. I don't have a number exactly though. Okay, so we would appreciate those specific numbers. But last I checked I had a bill. Um, that was very based on what happens in Sweden, and, and part of the reason many infants die in New York City based on um, uh, suffocation is due to not having a bed, a crib. And uh, I would hope that the Department of Health hears this conversation and would support the bell so we can move it, or we, we move it, so that we can ensure babies have cribs in New York City. That is the number one reason. Um, what precludes you from setting up your own data database with this information? Yeah, it's, it, the state requires us by law to use their database um, so that there's one system of record um, for, for So state law would prevent you from collecting this data somewhere else. Well, is that true? State law asks us to use that system as our system of record. Okay, so I know record. state law asks you to, and that could be one record, but does that prevent you from um, collecting data for New York City separately from the state's database? So it's something we can look into, I think, and have a conversation. So question is yes or no. Does state law preclude us from collecting this data outside of the state's database? My understanding, and we will confirm this to you, is that uh, the state does require that any information we collect be maintained solely in their system, so they have a complete record of the investigation that we do, so that they would not allow us to collect that data or use that data in a system outside of their system. Right, we but I'm not saying a system or creating a new system. What I'm saying is could ACS, on its own, New York City, collect this information, compile this information in a way that the council could see it? Well, I'm not saying create a new database. We, we can analyze and report to the data, to the council data from the state system as the state allows us to do it. And we're hoping, based on discussions we will now have with the state, that we can use the new functionality that they've just added to the system Okay. to do that, but we need to discuss with them what the council is interested in and see if the state is willing to allow us to collect and analyze the data in the form that you want. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin to wrap up because I know my other colleagues have questions and this is not my hearing. Can you just go through, so, so Ms. Kennedy, this story, can you, so her children tested negative for marijuana but ACS made her go to court and she was mandated to an outpatient rehab program three days a week or risk losing her three children. Can you speak to this uh, specific case? Uh, well, I'm actually not familiar with it, but even if I were, we're uh, prohibited by law from talking about specific cases. Okay. But are there any case, so does ACS uh, mandate outpatient rehab programs for, for parents, for mothers? In some situations, yes. Has that been done solely based on marijuana? Uh, no. It has not. Our, so our, what was it based on? Our policies. It would be based upon a determination that uh, marijuana use or use of any other substance created a safety risk to a child that required some kind of intervention. And, and presumably in that case, the intervention would have been outpatient uh, uh, rehabilitation treatment. I, I also want to clarify that ACS doesn't mandate. It would be the court That's mandating. That's correct. Uh, the treatment. And ACS would have recorded, reported that to the court? Right. So ACS would have reported she uses, she used marijuana in this specific case so it, to the it, courts. So as the commissioner stated, it wouldn't just be the use of marijuana, it would be the use of any substance and the impact that that substance had on child safety. 
All righty. Uh, okay, I look, I look forward to, to, to certainly um, hearing more on this. I, Mr. Chair, I don't see why we should not proceed with these bills. Um, I, 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 I believe that ACS could give us this information and compile it in a way outside of the state's database, and I guess we could debate this today, but, um, and, and also, just, just lastly, do you believe there are disparities in this specific area? You cited it in your, in your testimony um, around marijuana and testing. So when we get this data eventually, will it show what I believe it's gonna show? I'm gonna ask the lawyers, uh, do the lawyers rule, ask a, the, ask a question you know the answer to. Will the data predominantly show that majority of cases that ACS, whether substantiated or not, investigates are centered in communities of color? Uh, I, I can't forecast what the specific analysis will show. I can say, as I said in my testimony, that we know that there have been racial disparities both in the criminality of marijuana use, mm -hmm. um, and there have also been racial disparities historically in child welfare involvement. Yep. Okay. All righty. I know the answer to the question, but I want to thank you for the work that you are, you are specifically doing uh, in reforming ACS, and I hope that uh, after this hearing that we will specifically start to address what we know are the disparities in the way uh, especially black mothers are handled, black and brown mothers are handled uh, in the general welfare system. So thank you. Councilmember Adams for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for this important hearing today. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, my, my issue, as I've listened to the testimony and the questions from my colleagues, my issue is the systemic criminalization of women of color pertaining to the matter at hand today. And as I've listened to the details of the Kennedy case, uh, which you don't seem to be familiar with, but several of us are extremely disturbed by that. It becomes very, very clear that there is a horrible issue with the federal government taking children away from parents who have provided a home for their children, for parents that have prepared a home for their newborns, that for parents who have prepared to love their children. And so my question is, when we look at the cases of marijuana versus alcohol, how are those cases treated differently in preparing the mother for the consequences of use by each of those substances? Are you asking either one of us or? Anyone that can answer. That's a very important question and thank you for asking that question. Um, so when we get a history from a mother and we're talking about substance use, the question is broad, do you use any substances and what do you use? And very often we get um, poly substance use, so marijuana with alcohol, marijuana with cigarettes. And I take your point and appreciate your point of what the federal government is doing in terms of separating children from intact families and healthy families. I think in terms of marijuana, it's an education. We don't have the literature all in. What are the side effects or sequelae of the marijuana? As I said earlier, we have not had good studies at all. So it really is about education, and I said, as I said from the maternal side, we do not report to anybody anything. It's totally about a conversation and education. Okay, I appreciate the answer. I, I think my question pertains more to the information that is provided to the mother. Uh, are you informing the mother of the consequences of her disclosure? Yes. So as far as the differences between alcohol and marijuana, again, 
what is the difference in treatment of a mother that has disclosed alcohol use so the versus are, marijuana the use? The sequelae are large. So the conversation around alcohol has to do with intrauterine growth restriction, mental retardation, fetal alcohol syndrome. That is a very different conversation with marijuana that we don't know the sequelae, um, that's not as del deleterious as alcohol per se. As I said earlier, it's the most harmful drug to a developing fetus, and that would be the education. If it's a woman who's drinking alcohol, that's a very straightforward, the literature is replete. Um, it is not replete with marijuana, and you can't say with clarity or with conviction that there's going to be a deleterious impact. So I guess, again, for me, uh, as a mother and grandmother, and looking at this mother, the, the most disheartening part of the responses have been, in hearing the responses for me, have been that for alcohol users, because it is legal, it's okay for marijuana users, and we really don't even have a measuring stick or a bar, a tool of measurement to even qualify or quantify punishment for a mother that we are absolutely tearing families apart needlessly. And that's not that I'm blaming you because I understand that you value your work, but I just want to make sure that I'm heard. The value, or the devaluization of single black women when it comes to their children and the protection of their children, and I listened to my colleague present a question which I thought was very interesting, and that had to do with the care of a newborn, all right? And I thought back to the care of my own newborn and co-sleeping with my newborn for the very first night of her life, over 30-something years ago. And the fact, a non-substance abuser, mm -hmm. that's okay, but the perception of a substance abuser, we are now going to criminalize a single mother for doing what I did as a non-substance abuser. Very, very typical behavior for any new parent to share with their newborn. So uh, I'm very disturbed by your testimony today. I appreciate it, but I'm very disturbed by your testimony today. Um, and I really, really hope that we do better, number one, with our reporting, number two, with our sensitivity, and I look forward to uh, passing the legislation that my colleagues have so brilliantly put forth. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Uh, Councilmember Reynoso for questions? That's it's going to be tough to follow. I really appreciate that testimony. I'm um, hearing that. Um, just want to be clear. I had my son in a health and hospitals facility in Woodhull Hospital. Um, I thought it'd be valuable that the facilities that I entrust that I've entrusted my community to go to is something that I can go to. I care deeply wood, bo about Woodhull Hospital. And I think they did a great job um, with my family. Um, and hearing these stories is very it's, it's troubling for me. Uh, but I, I want to ask some, some technical um, questions. I'm very concerned about your consent policy. Uh, in 20, uh, I want to say 2013, over 700,000 young men of color, mostly young men of color, were uh, stopped and frisked in the city of New York. It was found to be unconstitutional. In that, officers arrested about 60,000 young men of color. Um, to some, through something that they called voluntary consent. The voluntary consent made it so these officers asked mostly young men of color to go inside their pockets and empty them. As soon as that individual went in their pockets and started taking things out, they are voluntarily consenting to that search. They had no idea that they were doing that. They were incriminating themselves because of a lack of information. The cops for years after that said, we are letting them know about their right. We're letting them know that they have a right to refuse this search. We're letting them know about what this means for them. The problem is the power dynamic. When an officer tells you to take stuff out of your pocket, you take things out of your pocket in a fear of escalation, right? 
Now, somebody in a white coat, I'm thinking about when I was in the hospital and how deferential I was to any advice given to me by any, off, by any uh, doctor. That doctor could have told me, Antonio, you need to take three shots right now. And I would have put my arm up, go ahead, not knowing what it was. It's just, I trust the doctors. So these doctors are telling these mothers, hey, would you consent to this drug test? Right? Not knowing the harm that they could impart on themselves legally, uh, the, the possibility of separation from their child, all these things happening. And that you're asking that this consent be verified, this, this consent that could damage the life of this family be something that is uh, not signed off by the person that is consenting and that it be documented in writing by the person asking for it, the doctor, and then making it so that we as a city council can't ask for information related to the demographics of who is consenting to these, these things because of a state issue that you guys have related to reporting. It's just so much what I consider institutional racism. That's what that is. You institutionally are putting us in a position where we can't even help these mothers. You are institutionally allowing for a, 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 a process that is very questionable when it comes to consent to dictate the lives of these women and their children is very concerning. I think that your objections are again, uh, uh, are hiding behind this institutional racism and, and I'm not gonna qualify it. So I'm gonna push for my legislation to be had and force the health and hospitals to figure out a way that it can document the demographics of who's being affected outside of this system that exists uh, by which the state is the only pervert. We have no authority. We can't see it because the state controls it. Well, I want you to do it twice then. I want you to put on one piece of paper to the state. Uh, we just had this black woman tested. And I want you to check that same box in a different piece of paper that's gonna come to us. That's what I'm gonna ask for you to do. And I'm not, I don't have any questions. What I'm hearing today, uh, again, is part of this institutional, institutional uh, degradation and racism, mostly against women of color, black women in these hospitals, and we should be fighting against that. Thank you. Th thank you. I, I wanted to just add clearly, um, we're all very passionate about this issue because we know that racism and systemic oppression is, is, is everywhere, but just so you know that we, we have a, a number of, of articles and data that we've reviewed that totally backs this up. We have you know, the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health said, of the 8,487 cases of women who have had live births, 3% or 244 mother newborn pairs were tested for illicit drug use. And that women who are black and their newborns were 1.5 times more likely to be tested than non-black women. So this is a, a study and, and we are so, so concerned because the other issue is that even if the report is determined to be unfounded, it stays in the statewide central register for 10 years. That is a very, very long time to have something that is unsubstantiated follow you around when you are a, a person of color who is already disproportionately impacted by laws that were created to keep you down. So do you document when a call to the state is made in the file? That's not in the mother's file. It's not in the patient's file. You get the consent, but if, if and if the we test is positive, you don't document that you made a call? We don't make calls. The obstetrician does not make a call to anybody. On the baby's side, when it is documented, if the, if the pediatrician has made a call to the state central registry, that is, and that's usually with support of social work, that is documented in the newborn chart. Any, as I said, there are no, the, the reports to the state central registry of child abuse and neglect are not made by obstetricians, not on the mother's side. 
So we are, as I mentioned earlier, about, about bias training. In, in your testimony, you mentioned that there is a recently launched mandatory implicit bias training for all ACF, ACS staff and the creation of an Office of Equity Strategies and a new equity assessment that will help us implement strategies that identify and forestall potential racial and other inequities in each of our program areas. Does H&H have any interactions with ACS and does ACS ever educate the staff, especially considering this new training? Um, we have a great deal of interaction, um, quite a bit. Uh, I don't offhand actually know whether we have had conversations specifically about uh, implicit bias training or other equity strategies. I think it would be a very good idea, and that's something that I think I can say on behalf of Dr. Allen and myself, we will take back and, uh, and look for the opportunities to do that. Thank you. Um, before turning it over to Councilmember Grudenchik, I actually wanted to follow up on that last question. So when I uh, had the opportunity to go out with you, Commissioner, uh, to the field to meet with CPS uh, staff, uh, uh, it was a really great meeting uh, recently. And one of the suggestions that came from them was while ACS staff and CPS are doing implicit bias training, and they welcome that, and they're, they're I think, we're, we're very happy to do it, um, they felt that there was not the same level of training for mandated reporters, um, and that as CPS, they, they are investigating the cases that come to them. They don't originate the cases. They, they have to do their job, um, but that the number of calls that go into SCR are so disproportionately against women of color that perhaps we should be embarking on, I mean, health and hospitals would be a good place to start, but uh, perhaps we should be embarking on uh, a broader uh, implicit bias education with mandated reporters across the city, and there's you know, many thousands of, of mandated reporters, so this would be a difficult thing, I think, to, to be, present a logistical challenge, but what do we think about that idea? Um, well, I was, of course, there as well for that conversation. It was very interesting and I think uh, very well taken. Um, there's no question that, you know, as I said in the testimony, we are obligated to report any report, to investigate any report we receive, but there clearly are patterns of geograf geographic disparity and racial disparity in the, that reporting. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's something well worth considering. Mm -hmm. the, the designation of who are considered mandated, mandatory reporters is made by state law, and actually the requirements for mandated reporters are also set by the state. So I think it's a, a conversation we can certainly initiate with the state, when, mm -hmm. and perhaps along with the council. Um, but also, uh, in terms of specific categories of mandated reporters, including health and hospital staff, uh, there's certain thing, things we could enter, you know, uh, initiate on our own. Yeah. And uh, so I think part of the conversation that uh, uh, in response to, uh, to Chair Rivera's question, uh, I, I committed that we would do is to take back to our conversations with health and hospitals whether there's work that we can do together uh, around the mandated reporting that comes from health and hospitals and making sure that uh, implicit bias and other things are addressed in the training of those mandated reporters. Right, I mean, what was so striking was this wasn't a suggestion coming from you know, a city council member who you know, doesn't necessarily know what's happening on the ground, but from a CPS who obviously does. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Um, thank you, Commissioner Dr. Allen, Associate Commissioner Marks. Um, Commissioner, um, do we keep statistics on how marijuana use affects parenting? Have we, do we have surveys or any statistics regarding that? I mean, I appreciate the testimony and the answers you've given to I'm just wondering, uh, you know, from Dr. Allen's testimony, it's not something I think about every day, to be quite honest, but I, I do remember um, reading and hearing about the deleterious effects that alcohol has. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that. But I'm just wondering, are there statistics, similar to this, statistics kept for marijuana use? Well, there's certainly research. Uh, around the impact of marijuana. As, as Dr. Allen said, it is not yet um, quite very definitive. Um, so, you know, we, because our concern is, as I said in my testimony, our concern is about the, the safety and risk impact on children 
Um, as we do that investigation, that's what we're looking for. So anything that tells us or establishes a relationship between the use of any substance, marijuana or any other substance, and uh, potential impact on parenting capacity or safety of children is the kind of thing that we want to make sure that our policies are addressing as we do our investigations. Do you have anecdotal evidence yet? I mean, you've, you've got a lot of people in the field. I know the work that you're doing, and I, I greatly appreciate um, what you've done for the agency since you came here to us. Um, do you have anecdotal evidence that you can share with us, or maybe you don't want to share with us? I see the smile. I, I know yeah, the I'm dangers gonna, of anecdotes at times, so. Think, yeah, I've been doing this work a really long time, so I can certainly share some anecdotes, but I, I want to caution against, you know, using that in a systemic way. Um, and we, we look at each case and we assess each case individually, and they're very As you nuanced, have to. Course, yeah, they're yes. very, very nuanced decisions, and sometimes, um, you know, marijuana use, one example might be that, um, you know, the, the, a, a person, and, and people also have different reactions to marijuana re use, right? So that's something else to consider. So um, sometimes a parent may be using so much marijuana that they can't get up in the morning and they aren't getting their children to school on time. Um, you know, we see that happening. We see sometimes that they spend all of their earnings on marijuana rather than on food and basic medical care for the children. So it's those types of assessments that we have to make on each individual case. Would, would you say at, at, at that point, we, we would not be happy probably with any parent who was not getting their child to school on time, correct? Right. Um, and that, again, doesn't mean that that would cause a removal. That would just be the impact on the child, and then we would assess more carefully about what services we can provide to mitigate that. Okay. You know, we have a big continuum of preventive services, and, and, you know, when we see that sort of impact, that is always our first route. Okay. Thank you very much. I waited a long time for that, but I do appreciate the chairs uh, holding this hearing today, and I appreciate your being here today, and i got to go get ready for my hearing. So thank you all. Thank you, Chairs. Um, thank you very much, Councilmember Kredenchik. Um, so we have a few more questions to get through. Uh, and I realize we've had a lot of questions for Dr. Allen. I just have, thank you. Um, I just want a little bit of clarification. When you said that uh, the obstetricians are not mandated reporters, or they're, no, they're, not, they're not making the calls into the SCR? We are mandated reporters, um, but we have, if we have a mother who's using drugs, mm -hmm. and we get a positive urine toxicology, that does not result in a call to the state central registry. We don't consider fetuses children. Mm -hmm. And the state registration, the state central registry of child abuse and neglect, from my understanding, has to do with child abuse. And so, in, a, in an instance, um, and, and I, I don't, I don't believe Miss Kennedy uh, delivered at, at a health and hospitals facility, but in her case, the children did not have a positive toxicology. Um, and she had told her physician, her, her obstetrician, that, that she had used this for medical purposes. So in, in that instance, I mean, I, I realize it's not health and hospitals, but how could that call have then got into SCR if the child, it wouldn't have been the pediatrician, I assume, because they didn't have a positive toxicology. So I cannot explain that. I don't know that case, um, but it is possible that the pediatrician did call in based on the maternal drug result, which is in the chart. It's in, it's in the children's chart. But at the time of delivery, we transfer information about the mother that it's pertinent for the pediatrician to be able to assess right. the child. So we blood count, gonorrhea, syphilis, all the tests that we do during the prenatal period, hepatitis right. status, well, those are all status is actually disease, you know, those are all conditions that can be passed to the fetus that are, you know, obviously yeah. can present a significant risk to the fetus or to the to the newborn. I, it's I I guess my, my question is something happened there I've, and and I'm I'm wondering whether this is an outlier or whether this is, and I think, I mean, that's, a, that's the big question, I think. Is, this, is that an outlier, that case, or is, that, or, is, or is there something, is that indicative of uh, a broader trend? 
I can speak from my experience at health and hospitals. That is an outlier if it happened at health and hospitals. The obstetricians do not call in to SCR based on a maternal tox screen. Can I, so then I have a copy of the policy here that I know is, is hard to get your hands on if you're just a normal public person. But it says the director of social work services at each facility is responsible for ensuring the appropriate provision and or referral for counseling is provided to the pregnant and postpartum woman and any report made to the central to state central registry. Is it the director for social work services that kind of leads and manages this reporting? We just so want to based a social work evaluation of the family. The social worker would be the one who would recommend a call to the S SCR. Okay. So I, I wasn't trying to give you an answer. I was just asking whether, you know, the people that are obligated to the report versus the person who makes sure that they escalate any sort of note that they feel is serious. We're just trying to get a clear answer as to how the process goes. I didn't want to take us from beginning to end because we have a, some, some attorneys and some defenders and, and people here with personal experiences that we really want to get on the record as soon as possible. So I wasn't going to ask you to take us from step by step because we're a little bit unclear as to the details here. But I'm trying to at least pull information from your very own policy to understand who makes the call and how we can, you know, hold some people accountable. Can I get back to you on that? Sure. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to... As, as uh, Chair Rivera mentioned, we do have a, a number of people that would like to testify um, and have been waiting for, for a while, and, and so we appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I, I, I do want to go through a, a few more questions uh, for ACS, if that's okay. Um, so uh, if, if, there's, if these require a short answer, then, then that's sufficient. Um, can ACS determine a case is unfounded and close the case without an investigation if the sole reason for the report of neglect is a positive drug screening? Or do they have to do an investig a full investigation? If the, case, if the state refers the case to us, we are required to do an investigation. Uh, if, can the case be closed after a single visit if the only, if the only reason for the report was uh, marijuana use or drug use and it was determined that at that first visit, it does not appear that there are any other risk factors. Can that, or is it, or is that, is it going to take a full 60 days or somewhere around there? No, it definitely does not have to be a full 60 days. Um, it would require home visit and assessment of all the children and the alleged subjects, and then calls to the source and other collaterals. But we can certainly close a case way before 60 days, and we have done that and do that pretty routinely. Okay. Um, do we have a, a clear picture of how many cases? are called in where the sole risk factor is marijuana use? No, we don't, for the reasons we were talking about earlier, that the state system hasn't allowed us until recently, and, and we hope prospectively it will, hasn't allowed us to, seg to disaggregate by individual okay. type of substance. So no, we've not been able to do or, that. Okay, so then exclusively for substance use, but not um, w without disaggregating for type of substance. So. Um, with exclusively, not with other risk factors. Uh, okay, so in, I, in com I don't know that we have, yes, on, we only have uh, in combination. In combination. So about 25% with co in combination. involve allegations of substance use, uh, either with or without right. other allegations. Right, if, if it's possible to, to, to break that down further and disaggregate that, and I, I, I maybe will, will, I'm offering to, to work with um, uh, with OCFS to try, it would, be, it would be good for us to be able to know, again, this is all inform for informational purposes so that we're getting a clearer picture of how policies are impacting lives. Understood, we're happy to work with you on that. And I hope, you know, I hope I was clear in my comments on the two bills that our concerns are not philosophical at all. They're purely practical. Yes. Understood, and I, I'm confident that we can work together to uh, get legislation that um, can can gain the administration's support. Um, is there what is the procedure for CPS <clears throat> to determine marijuana use um, in a in uh, you know after the children are born? You mean? T can you just clarify what you mean by determine? Would that uh, be? 
Yeah, I mean, if there's a, if there's a uh, an allegation goes in uh, goes into the SCR of marijuana use, um, the, the CPS goes. How are they determining whether the, the the parent is using marijuana? Right. So you know, I just want to clarify that we we are doing more than determining just use. We're determining if the use has impact and if there are safety issues. Right. And in order to determine that, we have to interview everyone in the home and we try to do that separately whenever possible. Um, we would um, also interview collateral contacts, so pediatricians, schools when applicable, uh, neighbors who may be able to tell us what's going on in the home. Um, and then if we do have some um, suspicion of drug use, we'll, we'll turn to our CASACs, our Credentialed Alcohol Substance Abuse Counselors, so that they can help us do an assessment to see if the parent um, um, can tell us a little bit more about their potential use and the impact on the child. Okay, so it's, it's uh, the CPS isn't doing that on their own. They they involve the case act in that. Definitely not. And all through this process, there's um, a supervisor who's reviewing the steps that are being taken. In many mm -hmm. cases, with drug use, there are managers who review these cases. So they're definitely not doing that on their own. Right, right. I, I think we're. I think I think in in. Um, for the purposes of this hearing, I don't think that we're in any way insinuating that um, any particular staff is unqualified or unable or are doing mistakes. We're, we're more concerned, I think, with at least, I can speak for myself, kind of these systemic um, structural issues here, not, not necessarily um, uh, inappropriate um, uh, actions by any, any particular staff or staff level. Um, so yeah, that's that's certainly my concern is, is kind of the, the broader um, structural um, uh, practices in place and procedures. Um, going back to um, uh, the case that we've been talking about, uh, does ACS and for that matter, and we've we've talked about this, but I'm I'm not quite sure that I've. I've Clear picture. Does ACS or health and hospitals personnel fully tell a person when they disclose uh, something like marijuana use of the potential impacts um, that that could have on 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 their on their case moving forward? So, from the obstetrical side, as I said earlier. There is disclosure about a positive test. If the child is, it's not so much the mother's test, so I mm -hmm. cannot speak to the Kennedy case that you're referring to. Sure. I'm not familiar with it at all. Uh -huh. On the health and hospitals, the disclosure is, my conversation with you, if you're my patient, is our objective is to have a full-term pregnancy with the appropriate grown fetus without complication and that you and the child are drug-free at the time of delivery. The drug testing during the course of the pregnancy is not about reporting, and there should be no sequelae of, re of getting a positive test during the pregnancy. However, if you're born, if the child is born, if your child is born with a positive toxicology, there is a risk that based on the assessment of the pediatrician and the social worker at that time, that that will be called into the state central registry. Mm -hmm. So it is all dependent on the newborn toxicology, right. not the maternal toxicology. And marijuana, do we, do we have any clear picture from a medical perspective how much marijuana is required to cross the placenta to show up in a toxicology report for an, a newborn? Yeah, so I actually d did have that. I don't have it at my fingertips now. Okay. Um, Okay, so in that sense, it wouldn't. I mean, there, there's no um, HIPAA issue there in terms of, in terms of, a, if, a, if a mother discloses that she's used marijuana while pregnant, um, that then is not. Does she has? Does she have HIPAA rights there? That that uh, that, that. Say that again. Does she have? Does she have? Uh, sorry. Does she have HIPAA rights there? To in terms to, of her child. Well, in terms of her, if she's the if she's the user. Right. Uh, uh, her physician uh, is, is is her physician prohibited from then sharing that information because of her rights under with, privacy? With, with whom? W pediatrician? 
with, with any with pediatrician with with SCR with I, I you know you're saying that it's not being uh, called over to SCR but clearly it happens at some point somewhere. Um, so there is no HIPAA issue between the pregnant mother's medical record and sharing that with a pediatrician. Okay. That is in fact expected and is proper care. But with any with SCR, there's. So with SCR, that has to do with being a mandated reporter for child abuse and neglect. And when you're an obstetrician taking care of a mother with a fetus, the fetus is not a child. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So far. Right. I mean, it's 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 a it's an interesting question because if that then happens, I mean, it's a hypothetical. But if that were to happen. Uh, then, um, then is that mother's HIPAA rights being violated, or if if a call goes into SCR based on I'm sorry, this maybe is a uh, uh, splitting hairs here, or, or but I just that's a it's a question to ponder. We don't have to go further into it. Um, Do you still want to know the level of cannabis cannabis in the system that results yes. in a oh, positive sure. toxicology? Yes. For the casual user, two to five nanograms per ml. For the long-time user, greater than five nanograms per ml. Okay, that's in the in the in the newborn's blood, or you, newborn's urine. It doesn't. This, the threshold level for cannabis in the system to warrant a positive toxicology is just an absolute number. Okay. I would hope that the newborn is not neither a casual nor a long-term user. Of course. So it's probably maternal. But you don't just test the newborn. I mean, you test the pregnant woman. There are obstetricians and there are pediatricians. As the obstetrician, I test the newborn woman. The pediatrician will, I, I test the mother, obviously. And as the pediatrician, the pediatrician will test the newborn. OK. Um, we're hearing that there's cases where, when a removal happens, um, that a, a family cannot be reunited until the mother uh, tests negative for all drugs, um, including marijuana. Um, but if we don't believe, as a policy, that marijuana use is, in and of itself, um, a risk factor uh, for abuse or neglect, then why would we require somebody to test negative if it's not a risk factor? So that, that is not our policy, to, to require to test negative to get your children back. So um, when the children were initially removed, there would have had to been other things that caused the removal besides just the use of marijuana. So our assessment for reunification would be whether they completed the service plan that was initially established and then we would report that to the court who then makes the final decision about reunification. But we certainly don't have any policies that say that um, positive marijuana tests will prevent reunification. Okay. Um, going back, Commissioner Hansel, to your testimony about uh, OCFS, you said it, we've been in conversations with OCFS and are verifying that SCR does not accept substance use related reports nor refer cases to ACS to investigate when there's no allegation of impact on child safety. Can, can you uh, give us a little bit more information as to the status of those conversations? Have they been responsive to this? Yeah. Um, I mean, our understanding is that that is their policy. But we also have also heard it anecdotally, as you have, that uh, there have been cases where that hasn't happened. So we want to make sure that uh, it is clear on their part that they, uh, that they would not accept those cases and they would not refer them to us or to any other county around the state for investigation. Um, so yes, and we can report back to you on, on the, uh, how those conversations go. Um, and uh, let's see. So is it only the, I just, I'm, we just really just want some clarification. Is it only the newborn positive test that results in a report to the state? Yes. So, and it's not a, a, in and of itself, as we're hearing that there needs to be actually collateral information that speaks to the behavior of the mother and what her, whether or not she can parent. Right, so because the, 
all positive toxicology results have to be conveyed to the social worker, and that's whether prenatal, labor, delivery, or postpartum. So though you might be gathering this information throughout the pregnancy, mm -hmm. it's only when you do the newborn test and it results positive that a report is made to the state. Yes. Okay, so I just have a, a couple more questions here. Um, Commissioner Hansel, you mentioned in, your, in the hearing this past fall that and as we just talked about, that marijuana use alone is not used to justify removing a child from the home, restrict parental visits, or keep a child from being reunited with their parents. However, we've been hearing, obviously, from advocates uh, that the opposite is true. How do we, how does ACS ensure that the policies that you've spoken of throughout this hearing and at the last hearing um, are actually being implemented on the ground? So where is the quality mm -hmm. control on the levels from commissioner down to CPS? Yeah, no, that's a very important question and it is a major, it certainly has been a major focus during my tenure uh, at ACS. And I actually want to answer your question in two ways, council member, but um, the challenge, and I think, I hope I made this clear in my testimony today, the challenge of ensuring that in every one of the 60,000 investigations we do every year, our practice is entirely consistent with not just a policy, but multiple policies that govern how we do that and how we make the decisions and, and the outcomes of those investigations. It's an extremely daunting challenge. I've never done the work myself, uh, unlike uh, Associate Commissioner Marks, but I've shadowed CPS in the field, I've reviewed hundreds of case records, I've sat through hundreds of child stat sessions now, mm -hmm. and uh, very often these are incredibly difficult and nuanced decisions. Mm -hmm. So it is critical, it's one of the most important things, uh, most important aspects of our work to make sure that we are doing everything we can to ensure consistency between policy and practice. Um, and we have put in place what I think are very robust quality assurance mechanisms to do that. Child stat, of course, is a core part of that work. And you know the history of the child stat and how we uh, brought that back a couple of years ago, and I think that's made a big difference. Um, we have also instituted over the last year, year and a half, a process that Associate Commissioner Marks oversees where we, um, we uh, on a, a rotating basis, uh, we, we identify the highest risk cases that are under active investigation and make sure that they're not just being handled by the CPS team as they normally would, but they're getting a higher level of review um, from a team of quality assurance specialists under Associate Commissioner Marks' supervision um, and making sure that you know, we uh, identify any deficiencies in the investigative process. We give that input to the CPS team at a time when it can actually affect the uh, outcome of the investigation because the investigations are underway. Um, we do uh, periodic safety forums to reinforce practice with child protective specialists. We do ongoing training. So we have, uh, I think, very robust mechanisms in place for the specific purpose of doing everything we can. I would never say ensure. Right. <laughs> I can never say we could promise in every single case, but to um, uh, do everything possible uh, to align the, our practice in every investigation we do with our policy. The other thing I would like to say, though, is I know you know you uh, you have heard and from advocates and elsewhere um, instances, and we do have re regular dialogue, as I said, with the institutional providers. But if there are cases you hear about in which it appears that the practice has not been, um, I would very much encourage you to m make them uh, available to us. We obviously can't discuss them publicly, sure. But I can certainly commit that we will do a thorough review of any case. Uh, that comes to your attention where it appears there may have been a misalignment between policy and practice. Right. Right. Um, and it just, from a, if, 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 from a CPS's perspective, how much weight, or a supervisor's perspective, how much weight do we give in the constellation of, of potential risk factors, how much weight do we give to marijuana use? Is, that, is there a scientific, is there a number that we can ascribe to that or? No, there's, there's definitely not a number that we can ascribe to that. It's, it's again, going back to um, looking at the impact on the child. I mean, marijuana use may mean absolutely nothing at all in terms of safety, uh -huh. right? And, and then on the flip side, there could definitely be impact on safety. It's really about making an individual assessment on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. And then my final question, at the end of an investigation, uh, does ACS provide details as to how to have a name removed from the SCR if there's, uh, if there's no findings? 
Yes, yeah, so we give out what's called um, a notice of, if a case is indicated, a notice of indication, and that's something that we're mandated to do, and we give that to the parent, and that um, notice gives them all the rights and the address to where they can write to request that. Okay. Um, so we want to thank you very much. I think that there's a lot of work that we can do together uh, to, get, to get clearer data uh, this is an evolving field here because of the potential legalization of marijuana, and, and we want to make sure that um, that our system is more fair and that we are not disproportionately penalizing particularly women of color in our city. Um, uh, for, for doing a practice that could very well be fully legal and um, potentially uh, not as harmful as, as many other substances that people consume and uh, during pregnancy. And, um, but without the data and without a clearer picture, um, we can only rely on what, what comes to us and the anecdotal evidence that is presented to us. And, we need better, clearer information. And so that's what we're after here. And, uh, and so we look forward to working with you all uh, to try to achieve that. And we do as well. And I'll turn it back over to my colleague. Thank you for your testimony. We'll, we look forward to working together. And I will just say that we're totally aligned. I hope you'll stay for the testimony here. We have some attorneys who are on deck as well as hopefully a, a, a personal experience um, that we can all learn from and gain insight. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to call up is uh, Robin Wiley. And again, thank you all for your patience. Nyla Natarajan. Jessica Prince. Jane Cooper. Brianne Ryer. And Shakira Kennedy. Thank you all as, as soon as uh, you're ready to begin. If it, you, don't ha you don't have to be the first one. It's up to, up to you all. And I just wanna say how amazing this panel is just, just by the look of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. Doing the work. My name is Jessica Prince, and I'm an attorney with the Family Defense Practice at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. 
I'd like to share the experience of one of our clients, Marion, who gave birth to a healthy baby girl at a New York City public hospital. When she gave birth, Marion was tested for drugs. She was tested without her consent or her knowledge. When her drug screen came back positive for marijuana, hospital staff told Marion that they had to test her newborn as well. But when Marion's baby came back negative for all substances, Marion was happily allowed to take her baby home. Her baby remained home with her for two weeks. She attended not one, but two well baby visits with her baby. She was happy to see that her baby was progressing and growing as she should. It was during that second pediatric visit that she was notified that there had been a second toxicology test on that baby at the time of birth and that that test had been positive for marijuana. The pediatrician said that as a result, they had to call ACS, but not to worry because the baby was clearly so well taken care of. It wasn't okay. ACS called. ACS knocked at the door the following day, and the caseworker told Marion that she had to remove her baby. Now, in this case, Marion was able to convince the caseworker to wait until the father came home from work, that he would take work off, and that he would take care of the baby. So as a result, Marion's baby was able to stay home. But Marion was forced to leave her home and told to come to court three days later, because this was a Friday night, Marion had nowhere to go, she had no attorney to, act, to ask questions of, and she spent those three nights on trains on the subway. In court on Monday, once Marion was provided an attorney and she was able to appear in front of a judge, the judge ultimately denied ACS's application to continue separating this family, and Marion was allowed to go home under a list of court-ordered conditions, all of which were requested by ACS, which included a drug treatment program. Following the hospital testing of Marion and her baby, there were no services or treatment or follow-up care of any kind that was recommended or required for the baby or the mother. At the end of its investigation, ACS marked the case as indicated, and as a result, Marion's name will stay on the state central registry until Marion's baby turns 28 years old. Mm -hmm. Her name is on that registry, and it'll restrict her ability to get certain jobs and certain employment. So who all is affected, or who does, who, who does this happen to? You want me to stop? You can finish. Okay, so who does this happen to? Um, just like the racial disparities in stop and frisk practices, the test and report approach taken by hospitals disparately affects mothers and newborns of color. One study showed that African American women are actually 10 times more likely to be tested. And a survey done of New York City hospitals exposed what we suspect, that public hospitals serving poor women routinely test while private hospitals in upscale neighborhoods do not. New York law does not require drug testing. It does not require the reporting or filing of a case based solely on in utero exposure to marijuana or any other drug. There's simply no justification, and what happened to Marion and her daughter in the name of child protection was unjustified by the law, science, or public health, and it is not at all uncommon. It happens often, and what I can say in response to what I heard earlier today on some of the testimony is that the hospitals absolutely do report mothers when they test positive for any substance, especially marijuana, that we see petitions filed in court against these parents when it is simply a positive toxicology for marijuana on the mother, no positive toxicology for the baby, that we see those cases. And I also would like to just emphasize that who from the hospital is the one reporting. There is a policy set up of who's the one reporting, and it is an obstetrician or a pediatrician who is making a call to the social work staff who then reports it to ACS. Um, and that's the way these cases come into court, into family court, and it is absolutely a basis for the kids being removed. And I'd just also like to say that it seems to be that there's a complete divide between the policy and the practice
that is being talked about in this room. Um, it may be policy to not remove children based on marijuana. It may be policy not to file cases based on marijuana, but it absolutely happens in practice. Oh, thank you. So if you, before we go on to the next panelist, I just have a couple questions on this. Um, I'll, I'll, okay, we'll, we'll wait until the full panel. Uh, speak. I think you'll probably hear a lot of resounding points. So, <laughs> um, My name is Brianne Ryer, and I'm a supervising attorney in the family defense practice at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. Um, as I submit this testimony today, one of our attorneys is on trial defending Mr. James. When Mr. James' son, Jr., was born, ACS commenced a neglect proceeding against him based on his marijuana use and removed his newborn son from his care. Today, Mr. James and Junior remain separated, despite the fact that prior to his son's birth, Mr. James engaged in both a substance abuse treatment program and a young father's program to prepare for, prepare for his child's arrival. Mr. James completed the young father's program and continues in his drug treatment program to this day and is testing negative. However, ACS will not return Mr. James' son to his care because he has not yet fully completed his substance abuse treatment program, which can be six months to nine months to a year. In yet another case, Ms. Green tested positive for marijuana at the birth of her child. She alone tested positive for marijuana at the birth of her child. With no other children and no prior ACS history, a case was filed against her based solely on the positive marijuana toxicology. ACS's prosecution of marijuana cases is aided and abetted by public hospitals who routinely drug test our clients, predominantly black and brown women, with or without informed consent. We know that this is happening because the petitions filed in court tell us so. The petitions tell us that the hospitals where our clients give birth are public hospitals, most frequently those run by New York Health and Hospitals Corporation. The petitions also tell us that our clients were subjected to intrusions on their bodily integrity in a way that wealthier, whiter communities are not. What the petitions do not tell us is whether or not our clients ever consented to these intrusions, whether they were ever informed of their right to refuse such testing, either for themselves or their newborn child, or whether they were ever even informed that the testing was done until an ACS worker visited their hospital room. We do know, however, that in at least some cases, these tests are being affirmatively refused by our clients and our clients' babies are being tested anyway. Evidence of this can be found in medical records received from ACS as part of discovery on marijuana cases. In reading through one such record, our attorney discovered that our client was informed by hospital staff that even if she didn't consent to herself being tested, her, the hospital would test her newborn child anyways. The hospital justified this threat under the guise of ensuring the safety of the child. Did they stop to consider whether or not they would make this same request of a wealthier or white mother? And I will say, as Ms. Prince also noted in response to some of the testimony we heard from doc Dr. Allen earlier, I personally and several of my colleagues and staff from two different family defense firms now have been reviewing medical records for seven years, and I've absolutely never seen the doctor's note referencing informed consent whatsoever. Their race is routinely reported in those records. Whether or not they're tested is, I've never seen a conversation about informed consent. Unfortunately, these fact patterns are all too common for those of us on the front lines. Sitting in family court and observing the faces that pass through the revolving, revolving door of the child welfare matrix makes one painfully aware of just how overrepresented parents of color are in this system. According to OCFS's own data, in New York City, three-fourths of children in foster care are black or Latino, while another 18% are classified as unknown race or ethnicity. Only 6% are white. In other words, it appears that potentially 94% of all children in foster care in New York City are children of color. If what we see is indicative of reality, then the only parents who use marijuana are poor mothers of color. But we know that isn't true. Uh, a former council, uh, council member who was with us before made the observation, and it's a correlation that defense counsel makes a lot, between stop and frisk intrusions and these intrusions in testing. Um, obviously, stop and frisk was found to be unconstitutional, but I think for us it's even more alarming because instead of searching someone's pockets, they're searching our clients' wombs 
and they're searching our clients' homes, their blood, their hair, and all without the informed consent that was indicated. Um, I think at best, there is a gaping disparity in the policies being discussed before the council in the actual application we see in court, but most importantly, the applications and the way it affects our clients' families. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jane Cooper. I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. We represent the majority of children whose parents are charged with abuse or neglect in family court. And we thank you for the opportunity to testify today on, you know, about this important issue. Um, as this the council is well aware, the child welfare system has a profoundly disproportionate impact on families of color in New York City. The same disparities exist when looking at the NYPD's policing of marijuana in New York City. As a result, we have to look very carefully at what our policies are and how they are implemented. Determining when drugs, including marijuana, is a factor in child maltreatment is an ongoing challenge. Substance abuse is considered within the child welfare community to be a contributing or aggregating factor in at least half of all child maltreatment cases. However, it has not been established that marijuana use by parents correlates to harm to their children. In fact, Columbia University neuroscientist Carl Hurt, who testified on this issue before family courts in New York City, posits that, quote, the belief that casual marijuana use impairs your parenting has no scientific basis, and pot use that isn't excessive is on par with having a drink now and again, end quote. Whether parental marijuana misuse poses or use, I'm sorry, poses a risk of harm to a child is dependent upon the individualized circumstance of the parent and family. ACS should be working to determine this risk using science and best practices. Instead, New York law says that a parent's repeated misuse of an illicit drug, including marijuana, is considered prima facie evidence of neglect unless that parent is also voluntarily and regularly participating in a rehabilitation program. In other words, a parent who recreationally uses marijuana repeatedly or tests positive for marijuana on multiple occasions demonstrating repeated use is presumed to pose a risk of harm to their children that amounts to the, to the level of neglect. This has been borne out repeatedly in case law, which finds that um, repeated use of marijuana, in fact, by itself, without any demonstration of how in, that marijuana use impacts a child, is neglect. New York law, in effect, equates this repeated use with abuse or misuse that would potentially, and certainly not in all circumstances, but could potentially pose a risk of harm or actual harm to a child. This law, coupled with racially biased policies and practices in law enforcement and in the child welfare system, have a profoundly negative impact on families of color in New York City. Mandated reporters in New York are required to make a report to the state central registry when they have reasonable cause to believe that a child is being neglected, including parental misuse of drugs like marijuana even in cases involving what is ultimately recreational marijuana use, ensuing investigations can lead ACS to impose safety plans that demand cooperation with preventive rehabilitation services. Failure to comply with these plans puts parents at risk of court involvement and ultimately removal of their children. Even without court involvement, parents risk placement on the state central registry for neglect, which in turn negatively impacts their employment opportunities and corresponding ability to provide a stable environment for their children. An indicated case on the state central registry as well as misdemeanor convictions for marijuana related offenses also frequently prevent relatives coming forward to care for children in foster care from becoming certified foster parents. We support the specific resolutions and bills proposed by the New York City Council and provide several additional recommendations. Resolution number 740, which calls upon ACS to implement a policy finding that mere possession or use of marijuana does not by itself create an imminent risk of harm, warranting removal, should be expanded to include, um, to prevent mere possession or use to serve as a barrier to reunification of a child as well. We additionally suggest that the City Council call on ACS to implement a policy of not filing neglect cases based solely on a parent's use or possession of marijuana without a clear and articulable showing of the harm that such use or possession has caused or is at risk of causing to the child. Manhattan and Bro Brooklyn District Attorneys have enacted similar policies with regard to the prosecution of marijuana offenses in the criminal justice system. We further suggest that the City Council call on ACS to issue guidelines 
based on best practice and science to assist those, work, those who work in the field to determine whether marijuana use pre prevents a parent from providing adequate supervision and protection of their children, and also detailing the impact that marijuana use should have on decisions regarding a parent's need for services or a child's placement or continuation in foster care. Finally, we ask, on, uh, we ask City Council to call on ACS to issue a policy that prior misdemeanor marijuana convictions by itself should not be the basis for a discretionary denial of a foster parent certification for relatives coming forward to care for children placed in foster care. I would like to just add one piece that is in our, point you to one piece that is in our um, written testimony, which is not necessarily perfect data, but to, to provide some information to the council. We reviewed um, the neglect proceedings from 2017 in which we were appointed to represent the children in those cases. There were approximately 1,200 cases that included some type of drug allegation, substance um, abuse allegation, and approximately 400 of those were only involving marijuana. It's not to say that there aren't other allegations in those cases that were filed, but with regard to the substance abuse allegations, um, just over 400 of them involved only the use of marijuana. In at least a significant number of those, as pointed to by others testifying here today, those, um, the marijuana allegation was the sole allegation for neglect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nila Natarajan, and I'm a supervising attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services in the Family Defense Practice. Today, I would like to focus your attention on the ways in which current practices perpetuate extreme and disproportionate consequences of marijuana use for poor communities and communities of color, and in particular, the ways in which marijuana use is used as a barrier to reunification, that is to keep children in foster care, and as, as a reason to prolong government surveillance over our families. Every day in Brooklyn Family Court, marijuana use is almost always conflated for misuse and neglect by ACS. That is to say, family court, ACS, and the law make little to no distinction between recreational or thoughtful and safe use of marijuana by a parent and the use of drugs that has an actual and quantifiable, quantifiable harmful impact on children. This misinformed assumption almost always leads to a demand by ACS that parents practice total abstinence in order to regain custody of their children from foster care or to close a case and end mandated ACS sur surveillance over a family. So we heard testimony today that it's not ACS's policy to demand someone test negative before their children are returned, but in practice that is what ACS demands. While marijuana use may be the, ca may, may be the cause for initial filing of neglect or the removal of a child, it is even more often used as a barrier to reunify a parent with their children to the favorable or timely settlement of a case, or as a means to prolong, as I said, needless state surveillance over marginalized families. This means that even if the allegations of neglect against a parent do not reference a parent's marijuana use, the family court and ACS can and do still require that parents abstain from using marijuana, and it's a demand that comes with extreme and punitive consequences. In this way, marijuana use is used as a way to arbitrarily impose moral judgment on our clients, a reflection of class and race-based prejudices. I want to be clear about two significant ways in which these consequences manifest for our clients. First is that they're asked by the threat of child removal to participate in a full drug treatment program. This can, can include going to treatment three to five times a week for several hours, hours a day, and then to continue to submit to random drug tests for an indefinite period of time even after having consistently tested negative for marijuana. It may even include a full-time inpatient drug treatment program. This demanding schedule can severely limit our client's ability to gain and maintain employment, to pursue an education, or even to spend time with their children. I have repeatedly been told by my clients that they have lost their jobs because of the demands of these drug treatment programs. Second, our clients and their children continue to remain separated, meaning they are children in foster care today for extra months or years um, who can only see their parents in supervised setting twice a week for maybe two hours because their parents have not completed a drug treatment program. 
It's important to remember that foster care correlates with worse outcomes at every stage of a young person's life and that the trauma of separation, as we've seen at our country's border with Mexico, leaves lasting scars. We are irreparably harming children and families with our current practices. We call on the City Council to increase the transparency and accountability of ACS and health and hospitals in their investigation and reporting of marijuana-related cases, to be a leader in the efforts to increase protections for patients, requiring written and informed consent for drug testing, and we call on a clear policy by ACS prohibiting any adverse action against a parent for the mere possession or use of marijuana. I would like to share three client stories uh, in which this stigmatization and punishment have, uh, are clear. Ms. G's children were removed from her care due, an ex due to an unexplained injury to one of her children. After obtaining medical records, it was clear that her, ex her explanation um, was reasonable and consistent with that child's injury. At that point, her children had already been in foster care for several months. And the, and the only barrier to her reunifying with her children is that she was testing positive for marijuana. Again, not part of the initial allegations made against her. Her children were only returned to her care once she completed a drug treatment program and consistently tested negative for marijuana. This delayed her reunification with her children by seven months. Ms. P and her child tested positive for marijuana at her child's birth. ACS, ACS was called and for 16 months, she engaged in a drug treatment program at ACS's request. When Ms. P continued to recreationally use marijuana, ACS filed allegations of neglect against her, alleging that she failed to voluntarily engage in a drug treatment program and sought an order that the court granted that she, was ex that she be excluded from her home. Ms. P visits with her child nearly every day without any reported safety concerns, but cannot be alone with him and cannot return to her home because she continues to use marijuana and has not entered a drug treatment program. Lastly, Ms. F tested positive for marijuana at her child's birth, which triggered ACS entering her life and finding alle filing allegations of neglect against her. ACS recommended that she engage in a parenting course, domestic violence counseling, a drug treatment program, and mental health evaluation. Daunted by this litany of services, Ms. F decided to arrange for her mother to, to care for her child. ACS continued to pursue a finding of neglect against her, and though she visits with her child nearly every day without, again, any reported safety concerns, um, and she continues to plan for her mother to care for her child, ACS continues to request that she complete a drug treatment program for marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. Just make sure the microphone's close. Okay. You can pull it over to you. Okay. Here we go. Freaking me out. <laughs> um, hello, uh, city council members. Uh, Thank if you. you could pull the microphone a little bit closer. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. Thank you so much, uh, city council members, for listening to our voices today. You all, I'm, I'm sitting in the back and I, I felt like you guys were superheroes because you were literally asking all the questions I continuously asked and I continuously ran into the same roadblocks you met today of indecisive answers, very gray area sort of answers. So I just, I appreciate you all so much. Uh, my name is Shakira Kennedy. I'm 29 years old and I'm a mother of three beautiful children. My twins just turned a year in March. Uh, my seven-year-old daughter, who is my eldest, goes to one of the top three schools in the entire borough. She's also in the Gifted and Talented program. She's been in that program since kindergarten. She's in seventh, second grade now. And she's also a Girl Scout. I'm a very dedicated mother. I had all three of my children with the same person, the same man who I've known since high school. We were on the verge to becoming married and we were very happy parents. My pregnancy with my twin boys were of, was extremely hard. Just to give you some sort of idea, I weigh close to 160 or so pounds pre-pregnancy. At the end of my fifth month, I was less than 110 pounds. I couldn't keep anything down. Just taking my daughter to the bus stop, which was two blocks away, took me in half an hour. So I would have to plan accordingly to take her to that bus stop, make sure I don't pass out and see her get on that bus and then walk home. It was very difficult. Their father worked 
uh, in the daytime at that point in time, so he wasn't home to deal with all of this. This was my job as their mother. So it was extremely hard. I, I sought out what I thought was the best medical care for my children because I read and researched having twins usually comes with complications three out of the four times. So I made sure I enlisted in a hospital that had at least a level three neonatal care unit. So God forbid something were to happen to my children, they're where they're supposed to be. Um, I had a lot of emergency trips because of severe dehydration. And in one of those uh, trips, I disclosed to the physicians that I, uh, I take marijuana to help with uh, the nausea, because I couldn't eat. I was throwing up more than I was consuming, and I had to help my child with her homework. It, it, you know, this wasn't my first set of children. So the, I was told that was fine, it's okay. They asked me, oh, I'm sorry. Just keep going, don't, don't, don't <laughs> okay. pay no attention to the buzzer. Oh, sorry, okay. They asked me uh, if they could drug test me, and I told them no. However, hours later, a, uh, uh, I guess a medical assistant snuck in the room and advised me they drug tested me anyways, but don't worry about it because this is just gonna be in my medical record. I didn't hear anything about this until after I gave birth to my children. They were of healthy weight of which twin babies are supposed to be. Naturally, twin babies are not gonna be the same size as a normal single child, because it's two of them in there, logic. But um, ACS did not see it as that case. My boys were tested for, they, they were tested negative for any drug in their system. I do not drink, I don't smoke cigarettes, I'm a hard-working, tax-paying citizen, and none of that was taken into consideration. Because I was positive with marijuana, the doctor advised me, well, you know, you're positive. We've tested the boys, but we're still gonna have to report you to ACS. Um, I guess if that's just a job, then that's just a job. There's nothing I could do with that. Uh, you're usually allowed a three-day stay in the hospital after you give birth, and on my third day, ACS met me at my bedside and gave me the paper letting me know they're launching a 60-day investigation and um, they're investigating me because the hospital had called them, they had concerns about my marijuana use. They, the, the hospital never asked about my seven-year-old daughter who has amazing credentials. It was never dis discussed on how we were living. I have a one-bedroom apartment. I take very good care of my children. None of that went into consideration just because, I don't know, I guess I'm, because I'm a black woman, uh, no one cared at that point in time. Um, a lot of these social workers within the hospital were kind of splitting hairs because um, I told them, I'm not going to breastfeed if you people are trying to make me seem as a drug addict. I don't want to make it, I don't want to endanger my children's life if this is the belief that that is here. So I had some social workers telling me, no, it's okay, you're fine. And then I had other so social workers telling me, well, if you just make sure you do everything that ACS requests you to do, then you should be fine. So I did not breastfeed my children because of that. Two to three days later, after leaving the hospital, I had to go to the intake meeting because, um, the same ACS workers who met me in my hospital bedside went home with me, beat me home, and uh, saw my children's father, who wasn't living with us, we were working to get married. They saw him washing our clothes, because obviously I couldn't do it. They took down his name and threw him into my case. So now this man, I. I have no idea where he is because we've had a huge falling out as any body would, you know. Um, he's not home and the kids really miss him and it's just because of me for partaking in marijuana. They said, uh, and this is not hearsay, this is what ACS wrote in the intake meeting. He sat down and watched me partake in marijuana so he's responsible for the marijuana misuse. So he got thrown into my case and 
they basically suspended my case because they couldn't find him. So I had to take my babies to this outpatient program three days a week with actual drug users. They did not have their, their shots. They were literally three to four days old. I had to take my children to this outpatient program for at least five to six hours, three times a day. I mean, three, three times a week just to um, sit in a group of other parents who were, some are trying to go to school, some had to quit work because they've been reported marijuana users. You sit in that room and you think you're gonna sit with such monsters and people who beat and hurt their kids. You're sitting with people who are trying to graduate with a bachelor's or a master's but got caught up in the system because of their color. So it's very hard and I just, I appreciate you guys so much for listening because these are the questions us as parents have. Whenever you ask a direct question, it's met with an answer of, well, it cannot be answered because not everyone has the same case. The drug testing, the voluntarily drug testing that they tell you you can kind of take, they also let you know if you don't take it, your, ch your children will be removed in court. So once I took that test, I naturally asked, what is the results of my testing? And I was met with, I cannot know the results of my testing. And when I asked my caseworker, can I get the results? She then told me I could go to the facility to get my, my results. And the facility told me they do not do that. They only disclose my volunteer results to the caseworker. If I want it, I would have to subpoena them for my own results. So that's, it's a, a lot that they were saying here was very, very hard for me. So I'm so sorry if I was back there just being a bit much and emotional. And I want to make it very clear, I am for ACS. We need ACS here. However, there needs to be a complete change in how they're managing people. I. I had uh, no marijuana within my system within the first week of going to the outpatient program. However, ACS very much forcefully forced me to stay in that program for at least three months. I had to complete it, no other choice. I had the people in charge of the program calling ACS every day and asking them, why is she here if she's testing negative? And they just, they, she has to do it. It's court ordered, she has to do it. Uh, my, my caseworkers at the outpatient rehabilitation programs uh, also had to call ACS in regards to the cribs because they said um, uh, I didn't have sufficient bedding for the children, so they were going to require, they were going to get that for me. And I didn't get any of that until the end of my drug treatment program, which was months later. They never offered me childcare for, for my children going to school, I mean, go, going to daycare while I went to this program, nothing. They tried to, at the time my daughter was suffering in school because I'm the, the main person who tutors her, and because my pregnancy was so complicated, of course, that started to elapse a bit. She had a little decrease in grades, and the caseworker told me, if I don't get her grades up, they're gonna have to remove her. So um, it's been very hard to have strangers come to your home and check for food in your fridge and in your cabinets every visit they come. Um, take pictures of my kids' social security cards and birth certificates with their cell phone. I don't even pay with a credit card in a restaurant out of fear of identity theft. And yet this stranger with their cell phone is taking a picture of my children's birth certificates and social security cards. If you could please eliminate that, because I, I, I don't understand what's the basis of that and why is that needed in an ACS case if it's just f for something that is just, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional again. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for. Thank you. I just, uh, it's a real burden for mothers of color that are happening today because just off of simple marijuana use, your children are being removed. And I've met other mothers 
cool, they've done this too. Because it, it happens so quick, you think it's more so of a joke, or not really a joke, but you, you're just, it's surreal. You can't think this is going to happen. You give birth, the ACS meets you the very next day, and then two days later, you get a court order. You're not healing in any of this as a woman. So there was a one, one case, a mother, she didn't go to court when they did, and they took her child away within five days of her just giving birth. These are the people that are filling the outpatient rehabilitation programs, not actual addicts, people who are hardworking and just got caught up in a system where anyone is characterized as a neglectful parent for any reason. A pedophile has more rights than we do right now. Because from a level one or a level two, I can tell if you saw a kid or you did something in a park, I can tell a difference. There is no difference with ACS, is what I'm trying to say. And that's not right. Not every case should last two months. What is, what is there to investigate in two months if there is no damage to the children, there's no problems, there's nothing? In the instance of my case closing, coming to a close, my lawyers did ask, uh, well, they petitioned for ACS to submit the proof that they had of actual neglect. They had to do this in a specific time frame of five business days. And miraculously, without anything being submitted, a new case got opened up on me with the same caseworker that I had beforehand. And surprisingly, she came that day just to let me know she's going on a three-week vacation. So I had two cases open on me on this, for no reason, and, and I, I couldn't fathom how fast everything was moving. They, they went and interviewed my daughter by herself in her biblical summer camp. They took her out of her class and put her in her separate class, and it was two caseworkers that interviewed her. And uh, off of the initial visit, she asked me, Mommy, how many lawyers do I have? And I had to advise her, honey, you only have one. You met your child's lawyer, you just met her. And she told me, well, why did that other lady tell me she was my lawyer? And it's just, it's too much of a gray area where the caseworkers and the supervisors can literally do whatever they want. And th there's no su suffering for that. The judges take everything of what they say into consideration. And you as a parent, if you're not squeaky clean, you're automatically guilty. This care worker, this, this caseworker is writing statements about you in a notebook with a number two pencil. There is nothing actually documented. These people need to wear body cameras because if, if you're gonna speak to someone's child by yourself, this needs to be something that is shown in court as proof, not something that you wrote in a marble notebook. And that alone puts me on a state registry for all of my working career life. I cannot work in a hospital, I can't work in a school. I worked in a pharmaceutical medical science uh, college for more than 10 years. I can never look to a job like that again because I'm on the state registry. And now I am a statistic, living um, as a signal parent with three children, and now I'm, I believe I'm a burden on the state because I have to apply for all these different state benefits because ACS drove the father away. So it's, I, I'm not saying that ACS is so terrible that they just need a revamping. Please revamp them. They cannot continue to do this to people of color and sit here and say, well, we're not going to give you statistics on how many people we get out of this neighborhood, but we're gonna give you statistics on how people use drugs, how many people use drugs. That's tomatoes and tomatoes, just please revamp them and I'll leave you at that thank you so much no for thank you Miss Kenny we and we are trying to get to not just the the data that they don't track because we know what 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 it's gonna tell us you right know how much people had cases in Flatbush compared to people who live in downtown Brooklyn or Borough Park I'm sure I'm sure so we, we're, we're that's why we have this hearing today and and thank you again for sharing your story and thank you so much. and being so open with us and real about it Thank oh, yeah. you. I'm an open book. <laughs> thank you so much. Ms. Kennedy, I just want to thank you um, for speaking and telling us your story. Um, and um, there's no reason in the world uh, why you should be on any registry of any kind. And you should be able 
to support your family in any field that you want to work in. Right. And um, you certainly have our commitment here at this committee that we will um, work with you uh, and work with uh, ACS and OCFS to make sure that that we have a, a, a fair resolution that brings you some semblance of justice. Um, but just as importantly, that we're looking out for other mothers uh, who, who would be mistreated the way that you were. And uh, you have our commitment that we're going to continue. It a lot because sitting in a program where you're being told as a woman, a man, black, white, or blue, that you're not a good parent and you've been taking care of them all your life, it really hurts you in a way that a knife or a gun can't. It's very hard when you have to sit there and listen to professionals tell you, no, you're wrong. You endangered your child, and you know you didn't. So just thank you guys so much. And how are your babies now? Driving me crazy, but they're amazing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they're amazing, medically per perfect everything. Just thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. I too would like to thank you all for listening to us today. Um, my name is Robin. I'm Robin Wiley, a parent leader at RISE. RISE support parents to become advocates for change in child welfare. I'm a parent who was affected by the child welfare system. From being on that side of the table, I can now support other parents and train professionals working in the system to understand parents' perspective. I'm here today to support changes to the law and policies that will reduce the fear and injustice that exists in my community because of the threat of ACS investigations and family separation. I am familiar with the fear that can prevent a parent from seeking help. When the crack epidemic was going on, many children were being removed from the arms of their parents, especially in Harlem and South Bronx. This made me very fearful to ask for the help that I so desperately needed. Two of my three children were removed from my care a year before I realized I was pregnant with my fourth child. I feared going to get prenatal care, constantly thinking that if I did, my baby would be removed at birth. That fear prevented me from getting the medical care and treatment I should have gotten during my pregnancy. Use of marijuana is not a safety threat. Use of marijuana, oh, am I on the wrong page? Sorry. I should have gotten the help I needed during my pregnancy. The day after my baby was born with positive toxicology, he was removed. I was tested without my knowledge or my consent, and the response was to discharge me alone without my son and without any help. If I had just had an open and honest doctor to speak to and ask me what was going on, I might have felt comfortable and been able to get help. Someone should have offered me services, not just fear. Research now says it's important to do everything possible to help parents keep the bond with their newborn child. That means programs where parents and children can go through the journey of rehab together. And policies that tell parents, as long as you keep doing what is best for you and your child, you don't have to be concerned about your child being removed. That wasn't the message I got. I felt trapped and alone. Today, fewer children are removed from their parents than they were when my children were in the system, but more parents than ever before are being investigated. The fear that parents feel when getting that knock on the door cannot be overstated. Parents in my community today are still living with the fear that they will lose their children based on the drug use that causes parents, that causes parents to need, who need help not to get it. Some parents don't need help because their use of marijuana is not a safety threat to their children. These parents can still feel threatened and unsafe. As one parent wrote for RISE, when we are investigated, we don't expect it to be fair. So when we hit a crisis, our fear keeps us hiding under a rock. We feel, to feel safe, parents need clear information about the law. ACS should report on how often hospitals are making reports against parents. Hospitals should not use, hospitals should not drug test pa patients without their knowledge and consent. 
and should not report drug use as child neglect without evidence of harm. Hospital policy should include how they offer help, not just judgment. In order for parents to have a different perspective on how to deal with the issues in their lives, they need assurance that help is available in their communities and hospitals without the fear of having their children removed. As we move forward to legalization of marijuana, parents need to understand how this may or may not affect them. ACS should make clear that children will not be removed because of, par because of parents' marijuana use when there's no harm. It's so important to, to reduce fear, and that, and that can only happen if we stop unnecessary investigation and removals. Thanks again for listening. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say to this panel, um, thank you um, for staying to present uh, all that you have presented to us uh, for this hearing and for the record. I don't think that there's ever, I can't recall, I've been here for nine years. I don't think that there's ever been a hearing that I can remember where the testimony of the administration is so different from the testimony that was presented by the advocates and people that have lived it. And, um, and that is really concerning to me. Um, it was as if we are living in two different dimensions uh, and uh, that both of them can't be right, basically. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do to make for a better system uh, that uh, really truly reflects uh, what we say is our policy and what we say are our aspirations. Um, they said earlier that they're meeting regularly with legal services providers. I don't know if that's really happening, but we, we're going to rely on, on you, this panel, uh, and, and anyone else you want to bring to the table um, to make sure that this policy is corrected. And I'm here for another two and a half years, and you have my commitment. I'll, I'll work every day of those two and a half years to try to do this. Uh, but I uh, 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 certainly need your uh, advocacy and help, and, and, uh, and really I'll follow your lead. Um, but I want to thank you. Thank you. And I think it, you know, what you said, Ms. Wiley, about that a parent said, when we are investigated, we don't expect it to be fair. I think that goes for most things affecting communities of color and women of color. And so, for you all to be working collectively to stop it and to make this a better system, which is clearly very broken, um, it means a lot to us that you would dedicate yourselves and your time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We're going to call the next panel. It's Clark Wheeler, Deanna King. Greg Waltman, and Nahal Zamani. It's okay. Where's he from? Can I just start with him so we can get over this? Thank you.
on behalf of the Center for Constitutional Rights. It's going to start the clock. Hold on. Thank you. My name is Nahal Zamani, and I'm an advocacy program manager with the Center for Constitutional Rights. And we'd like to thank you guys so much for chairing this key hearing. Um, I we was really struck by the morning, the earlier testimony, particularly because it talks about the role and the discretion that's afforded and the stigma and harm that results as this practice. Um, it's really compelling because as my colleagues will testify here today, New York is really on the cusp of legalizing marijuana. And at the same time, that there's this greater appreciation and consideration of the use of marijuana, the prevailing mechanisms around child welfare are falling greatly behind. And it's, a, it's not only, this is the opposite of harm reduction. This is actual literal harm, as was demonstrated by the powerful testimonies that preceded us. I'm really struck by the roles of H&H and, um, H &H and ACS here. And, and really thinking about are these the most effective and sound interventions that can be made for the well-being of families not to be separated, for, for mothers and their newborns to be safe, and, and really thinking about are these practices simply promulgating stigma and exacerbating and spreading harm? Particularly with regards to H&H, &H, a few things. They discuss, perhaps for the first time in public, the indicators that they're thinking about that that feed into decisions for healthcare providers to test for drug usage. One of them included m mood swings, which is absolutely almost laughable because that is pretty much an indicator of pregnancy, right? It's, it's almost a guaranteed indicator that presents itself during pregnancy. It's almost mandated by the sheer volume of hormones that we as mothers face. Another is access to prenatal care. And this is so striking to me because as we know, health disparities and health outcomes, particularly for women of color, especially for black women in this city with so much privilege, is absolutely unequal. And so factors behind having access to health care are very much the need for more interventions to meet moms at where they're at, not a predicate for judgment or a harmful intervention that actually could lead to their child being taken away. It, sh it shows the reasons why Resolution 746 are so key, why we need to streamline hospital procedures around who's being tested, what is the basis for those tests. We need to be grounding interventions in harm reduction, and that is working to reduce stigma. Um, we need to ensure that all patients are fully informed and are able to give consent freely. And we know, as the council members testified, we've seen it in the policing context. Consent is not given without the factors of power being at play, and that's absolutely a factor in the hospital or health administrative setting. Um, we're also extremely disturbed by the earlier testimony regarding consent practice by H&H uh, along these lines, which, as we know, when government policies are disparate, are different, they are absolutely prone to abuse. Lastly, as a mother, Childbirth, pregnancy, and the immediate period after is an incredible and complicated experience. And the fact that there are being government interventions that are leading to family separation, whether it's happening at our southern borders, whether it's happening uptown or here in New York City, is incredibly disturbing. Any type of removal, whether it's three days or several weeks, has severe ramifications for infants, for bonding, for the ability to establish breastfeeding, and the well-being of outcomes. Attachment for infants is one of the most crucial out outcome indicators for how they're going to proceed in life and how they're going to thrive. So the fact that government uh, interventions are ineffective, that are really stigmatizing and criminalizing, particularly mothers, as opposed to reaching them where they're at and helping them when they need it most, is absolutely disturbing. So we're so glad that you're holding this hearing today. We are very appreciative of the package um, of bills, the two bills on public reporting and the two resolutions, which really look at policy changes that need to happen, both at ACS and the state level. And in our testimony, we've further enumerated why today and in the coming months, truly changing the way that we're operating here in New York has to fundamentally change. Thank you. Let the record show that I am not Deanna King. I am Cassandra Frederick, the New York State Director at Drug Policy Alliance. Deanna had to bug, um, book it, so I had to tag in. Um, okay. 
So Drug Policy Alliance is ecstatic that the New York City Council is looking at these issues and has introduced two pieces of legislation and resolutions around this issue. I think it's critical for us to recognize that in order to dismantle mass incarceration, we have to expand the lens to really look at all the institutions that criminalize our communities. And by expanding the lens, we are able to have more gender responsive analysis of how criminalization is impacting New Yorkers throughout the city. The ability for child welfare agencies to go untested and unmonitored is what happens when we deprioritize women and their autonomy. The, the criminalization that has gone on for parents in New York City is really just a testament to how much we don't pay attention to the harms that happen to black and brown bodies. It's, it's gone on too long, it's, un, it's irresponsible, and so I'm incredibly encouraged that the council is taking this on um, in such a thorough way. I would offer that this conversation is happening around, within the context of marijuana legalization, but it is our position at Drug Policy Alliance that these policies should not stand for any drugs that we should not create a set of policies associated just for marijuana, but that we should look, be looking at all drugs and the ways that child welfare do not support parents that may be struggling with drug use. Especially within the context of the overdose crisis, this is imperative that we support parents at this moment. And you can see the, diff the racialized response to the way that we treat parents and we treat children in the fact that we are talking about it's, it was crack babies, and now it's Americans' orphans. You know, it's crack moms, and now it's, um, it's you know, parents that are struggling, that are at the margin, diseases of despair. And so we really have to take that mandate and recognize the way that our racialized policies have even influenced the way that our institutional, institutions criminalize communities and groups. We would offer that DPA asks the council to not only support reporting legislation, but also challenge the use of drug testing on pregnant people prior to delivery or the testing of newborns postpartum. We think that if you talk to doctors that are doing this work, they would seriously question the use of drug testing um, in, any, in, in most fashions. Um, this is, you know, we often talk about disparities, and I think for us, it's not that we want more people to be tested, we want the idea of testing to be questioned. The other thing that we would say is that for the legislation that uh, Councilman, Council Member Reynoso introduced, the council should consider amending the legislation to reflect our desire for data transparency, as the legislation is currently written that the data will only be accessible to the mayor and the members of city council. This data is crucial to our community for us to know what's going on, and it gives us more agency about what institutions we interact with every day. And lastly, I would say, the resolution in general um, for resolution 740, it's important for us to challenge ACS to shift its organizational priorities to become an agency of support and the reduction of harm as opposed to punishment and enforcement and another vehicle of law enforcement. I wanna go on the record and thank Deanna King for preparing this testimony. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Clark Wheeler and I'm a government relations associate at Planned Parenthood of New York City. Um, thank you to committee chairs Levin and Rivera as well as the committees on general welfare and hospitals for convening this hearing and to all the sponsors. Um, Planned Parenthood of New York City supports uh, introductions 1161 and 1426 and resolutions 740 and 746. Uh, PPMIC provides essential sexual and reproductive health care and innovative education programs throughout New York City. As a healthcare provider, we recognize the vital importance of building trusting relationships between our patients and providers. Our patients often come from communities that have historically experienced medical violence and may continue to lack trust in the healthcare system. One persistent form of medical violence in our healthcare and child welfare systems is the practice of punishing and separating families based on a parent's substance use. In New York City, this is a crisis impacting communities who also routinely experience sexual and reproductive oppression, including women of color, immigrants, and low-income New Yorkers. The idea that newborns and children should be separated from their parents because of marijuana use is rooted in racist, classist, and misogynistic ideologies that specifically target women of color and low-income parents and communities. 
Furthermore, a number of commonly held misconceptions about substance use contribute to the demonization and criminalization of mothers and parents who use marijuana. As we've discussed today, studies show, however, that marijuana use during pregnancy is not an independent risk, risk factor for adverse neonatal inc outcomes. Studies also show a double standard when it comes to marijuana use and parenting. In fact, black Americans use drugs at approximately the same rate as white Americans, but are 10 times more likely to go to prison for drug offenses. And one study mentioned earlier today, black women who tested positive for illegal substances were 10 times more likely to be reported to Child Protective Services. The legislation being discussed today creates an opportunity for the city to begin to address the impact of marijuana policies on our child welfare system and its particular harm on communities of color. In the face of attacks from a federal administration that is intent on separating families, New York City must be a leader in keeping families together and upholding reproductive justice in our child welfare systems. PPMIC urges the council to pass this critical legislation and looks forward to continued partnership with the city as we work to improve the lives of all children and families. Thank you. Just a really quick question, uh, and uh, ladies, if, if in your work, in doing this work, have you ever requested data, anything like, I mean, some of these studies that we've seen nationally, locally and statewide clearly point to the racial disparities that we all that we know already exist in food education healthcare and housing so in terms of your relationship with the agencies that testified here today has there been any sort of i guess cooperation or collaboration if only because i'm referring back to my council my colleagues uh, comment in that the stark differences in what was in their testimony versus the advocates the mothers and everyone here today is absolutely astounding yeah so i would offer that drug policy alliance has reached out to acs and the data that we were able to receive was not complete um, and part of the reason why we knew that we need data because they're not actually required to have it. There have been conversations with ACS, um, with some people within the organization, with myself particularly, talking about how to move ACS to a harm reduction model. When we've talked to other advocates in the space, uh, we realized that the problem was a lot bigger than a training and that we actually needed a fundamental shifting and that us engaging with the agency around doing trainings would actually make it more difficult for us to get to the questions that we're talking about today. And it's hard for us to um, work with people that are unwilling to see the full picture, which is evidenced by the, the testimonies that were given today. But I do wanna go on record that we started there um, and recognize that the problem was too big and we weren't operating. There's no both sides to racial discrimination. There, there is racial discrimination and it's, ingen it's disingenuous for us to engage in that kind of conversation when the facts are not the facts. Thanks. Good afternoon, council members. General Counsel, I'm Greg Waltman. I have a clean energy company. Um, you're right, uh, Councilman Rivera. It, it, it seems that there's um, a, a difference between advocates and people testifying in the testimony, which is indicative of similar search, kind of circumstances where you have, you know, lawyers and judges doing, saying one thing and doing another. So obviously, parsing that type of um, narrative into a larger context, you have issues, administration, obviously, uh, Christian Nielsen um, just departing, but does that necessarily signify any type of change in, in the type of um, immigration dialogue? Not necessarily. And why is that? Because there's this value hyper-protectionist limited scope um, cloud that prevents a larger dialogue uh, around these types of issues. And, and what, I'm, what I'm alluding to is that, um, and where energy, clean energy comes in, I know you deal with hospitals, but, um, is that if you put solar panels on the border wall, 10 feet, 2,000 miles, say you don't even get 2,000 miles, by that 2,000 miles it becomes 
uh, some $291 billion of revenue per year at 12 cents per kilowatt hour, all of a sudden you're exporting energy for cheaper where now you're reducing the barrier to entry for Latin American citizens to participate in the economy, resolving chain migratory issues because there in lies the opportunity that is in the United States has now been created in Latin America due to energy price stability and reduction. But these types of solutions and arguments and how we would contractually obligate those um, um, solutions from New York in relation to a solution of that type of federal capacity in a merits-based com conversation about resolving some of these issues has not been um, allowed or not, not been readily available to the public in the mainstream media. And, and why is that? It is due to the improperly formed bench trial monopolies of the type of um, immigration issues you have here and the value hyper-protectionism, essentially the same hyper-protectionism you see imposing upon the council and the mayor um, through Thrive New York City where people are being imposed upon to do or say one thing but then actually doing another. So it's rather disingenuous. So once we get over that hurdle and there's a more diverse conversation about solutions and where we're headed, then I feel like a majority of these issues, budgetary concerns, issues that um, are not directly related with your area of expertise, hospitals, but immigration and, and the collective will begin to resolve itself. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to add with regards to your previous question. Um, my organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights, has been litigating against the NYPD for its stop and frisk practices for nearly 20 years. And one thing that we found is that government agencies aren't super quick to disclose when they're discriminating against people's rights. Um, claims around not keeping data or um, arguing around practicability of, re of reporting out. Um, and that's not just for the NYPD, it's for many agencies, right, that engage in discriminatory uh, behaviors um, is, is kind of an expected response. Um, and so no government agency is going to be specific as to how they're exercising discretion for the encounters that their staff engage in with people. Um, that actually have racially disparate impacts and have huge collateral consequences, as they do in the case of ACS and H&H. &H. Um, but I, I urge the council to reject these practicability arguments, uh, to compel reporting, um, to mandate the author through the authority that's granted to you to shed light on the practices and the impacts of these so-called interventions, which are not being made in the preservation of families and the promotion of their safety or their well-being or, frankly, their dignity, That's right. but rather are ensnaring them through criminalization and stigmatization. And so that's why intros 1161 and 1426 get at this. Um, my fellow advocates and I were, were happy to enumerate particular additions in those reporting mechanisms that we think will get at the problem. But as the previous panel's testimonies show, this is the reality of of people of color's lives is that they are being criminalized in every aspect. And so we're so grateful for this, for this opportunity to shed a light on the real roles of government actors in promulgating and furthering racism and the real oversight that you guys exercise and power that you have to stop these horrible um, instances of family separation here in New York City from happening in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much um, for all that you do. I, I mean, I agree. I think the, the clear lack of definition and the, the you know, the, the, the path that the agencies have taken to, to create this ambiguity that only leads to anxiety and loss of wages, emotional trauma. Um, there's, there's so much that um, we have to do, and, and I know that this package is a start, so, and you all have been doing this work for a while, and we owe you so much for leading us in the right direction. So I look forward to um, c continuing the conversation and seeing what else we can do as a council, even if it's not legislation, it's just clearly bringing them to this table here and getting them on the record of all the things that they can't even tell us for sure, which is absolutely unacceptable. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.
And if there are no other members of the public who wish to testify, seeing none, going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much.